Think or Swim Trading from TD Ameritrade. Welcome back to Market on Close. We've got a closing bell up around the corner, but first let's talk a stock that got beaten up today on a pretty interesting headline from Walmart. Caroline Woods is in New York with an update on Altria, the cigarette biz, which uh, may not be getting as much shelf space in some Walmarts. That's right, Oliver. There's a Wall Street Journal report that Walmart is going to stop cigarette sales at certain stores across the U.S., uh, pulling them in various markets, including California, Florida, New Mexico, and Arkansas. But according to that Wall Street Journal report, Walmart has no plans to end cigarette sales altogether, but they're doing this to use space more efficiently. As you said, shares of Altria down 3% today. Philip Morris down 1.5%. I will note, though, that there was a Goldman, uh, Goldman Sachs analyst that came out and said that basically Walmart represents less than 5% of cigarette industry volume. She said smokers will still purchase cigarettes and they'll simply go to other retailers, such as convenience stores, dollar stores, and tobacco shops. But uh, speaking of analyst commentary, Altria did get a downgrade from RBC Capital today from outperform to sector perform with a $53 price target. run higher. RBC said Altria stock benefited from the rotation as one of the most defensive names in their coverage. Mm. Given its limited exposure to cost inflation, U.S. centric business and pricing power, it's up about 10 percent year to date. But also uh, RBC noted that high gas prices may cause consumers to trade down within cigarettes given exposure to lower income consumers. So uh, a downgrade there in turn shares 3 percent lower today. Interesting. Okay. So uh, that's kind of what I was wondering. Uh, even with the Walmart report, I can't help but to think about the overall move in the stock uh, these last several months uh, to that analyst point about uh, some reversal happening here when the market is just kind of taking the recent winners and selling them and then buying the recent decliners. That is the story here as this comeback extends. Thanks, Caroline Woods. There it is. Closing bell green across the board. Even the Russell, the small caps, would not be left behind. Russell 2000 just crushed the close. Small caps were down over 1% at one point, remember, and just uh, went vertical in that last uh, about two hours of trading here. Uh, we did see that the dollar also remained bid throughout the day. 10-year uh, yield was down on the session, uh, but it was more than that working for stocks. Just a huge comeback of speculative sentiment, a rush of buying GameStop, AMC, Tesla, Snowflake, even Chewy going to into its earnings this week, a stock that nobody wanted to touch for a year, basically. So we've seriously got some uh, appetite coming back here uh, from bulls, it seems like. Uh, what a session. The Nasdaq doesn't clear its February highs, but it sure is close. 15,000. Uh, we are right there on the nose, 14,990. So if we could just get a nice 10 points there, that would make my job easier for the next 24 hours. Okay, we got J.B. McKenzie and Mr. Sean Cruz uh, joining me here. Cruz is our contributor on the TD Ameritrade Network and J.B.'s Managing Director of Futures and Forex at Charles Schwab. First question, J.B., is that my favorite poker hand behind you, 85 Bears? <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is. It's the 85 Bears. All right. I've, I've seen it in all four suits, but never actually the guys in person. All right, Mr. McKenzie, uh, get us started here. Uh, today we saw the dollar bid, and oftentimes that's a, a sign of a risk-off session, not today. Uh, let's start with kind of the holdout here. What do you think's going on with the bonds and dollar both sitting uh, here near highs? Uh, the 10-year yield already broke through it but cooled off today. Dollar's not given up yet, though. No, not at all. I mean, look, it's just quickly on the on, on the on the bonds and, and overall, it's a treasury complex, and you've been talking about it all day, right? We had the inversion between the five and the thirty that occurred. It was very quick. It moved back. The twos and tens, where a lot of people look on that front end of the curve, 
that's steepened. So it's interesting that you have people calling for recession, question coming back and forth. It just depends on what part of the yield curve you're looking at. I think overall, the, the fact of the matter was that the yield curve between the two and 10 held, it did not invert, it didn't come close to it. I think that is kind of where the market kind of pushed away from sort of that, the concern and the sell-off. To me though, what was interesting is the dollar. And the reason why, Oliver, if you're looking at another big bid into it, we're getting closer and closer to hitting the yearly highs that we saw just a couple, about a month or so ago. But six of the last session bid up and we've been talking about the fact that the, can we have a time in which we have tre interest rates moving higher? Can we have the market moving higher? Right now, it kind of appears as though the market's getting yep. comfortable with this idea that increases in the treasury yields are going to happen. The dollar's going to hold firm. And oh, by the way, we're going to see a little bit of a bid come back into the markets or at least be on an upward trend. So I'm not going to say it's a bull market, but I'm not going to say it's a bear. But I think they're OK with the rising dollar right now because it's working its way six of the last seven sessions. Sean, how big a deal is it right now that we put a floor in the day Powell got that first hike in? I mean, it can't be a coincidence, right? I know that there's been some stuff that's happened since then, but the timing of it, it's like our uh, worst nightmare came true and we realized, oh, it's not reality. It was just a nightmare. Okay, we had a little bit of a sweaty sleep. Everything back to normal? Yeah, I mean, I, I, <laughs> you can actually look at a lot of the treasury auctions that are going on this week and engage really how, what is going on behind some of these moves in yields because that's when you get fresh players coming in putting fresh powder to work so to speak and they're still willing to buy treasuries and they're still willing to buy treasuries and and we got the two and the five year which is sort of at the front end of the curve and that's usually where you see um changes in, in near-term inflation and also changes in near-term fed policy really play out is in that two and five year um tenor so I think seeing demand coming in pretty solid is noteworthy. The other thing is you can see where demand's coming from, mm -hmm. and it wasn't coming from what they call the indirects, which is usually a proxy for overseas demand. That mm. actually was actually a little bit low, so it was more of direct bidders um, and some of the dealers here domestically in the U.S. End of quarter? That took down a lot of that. Rebalance? Pension funds or something? I think there's probably certainly a lot of money getting shuffled around right now and it looks at least for the time being that you're seeing some of that fixed income um, money going into the safety of treasuries i think some of that might actually be the money that's coming out of some of these corporate uh, names that have really been taking it on the chin so far this year i think you're seeing some of that money when mm. you see bond prices dropping like that mm -hmm. that usually means that there's a lot of selling going on out there and that might be some of that selling getting put to work but in the shorter uh, part of the market okay so if there's still a willingness to buy bonds after this uh, really nasty uh, bond sell-off uh, this past six months and really going on since the, the bottom for the yield in COVID, but really the last six months here that have seen us explode through 2%. JB, do we need to see more bond buying? Do we need to see more peace in the Treasury market for this equity strength to continue? Or to your point here, I mean, Yields kept ripping next to stocks. That's the holy grail scenario. Even Bitcoin. I mean, this is like across the board. GameStop, AMC, whatever people can get their hands on. Have people lost their minds? JB, I thought that the Fed was going to put an end to this nonsense. No, not at all. I think what the Fed has done is they've telegraphed that more hikes are coming and clear there's a willingness to be aggressive coming up here with a 50 basis point hike potentially coming down the market or coming into the marketplace. So I think if anything, that transparency from the Fed has allowed the market to be a little bit more confident in a decision to go into stocks. But also, I think it's important to note, you had a commodity sell off today, uh, Oliver, and that's an important thing and not a little bit. I mean, crude is down 10 bucks. Definitely. I mean, that is a monster move to the downside. You have agricultural products coming off significantly. So this inflationary conversation, I'm not saying it's gone, but those rising in those two me those two major commodities have tremendously come off, which I think gave a little bit of confidence or bid in the marketplace. The question is, is it sustainable or not? We're not gonna know that obviously until tomorrow. Well, that's where that dollar still feels like it's a little bit of a hang up for bulls. If it doesn't get through the March high that is already there at 99 half, then okay, to me that would be a real confirmation, right? If you get the dollar dropping here while yields are calm, stocks and Bitcoin are going berserk again. I mean, that looks like the type of thing that is the beginning of a big move, not the end of one. However, 
if the dollar does break out higher from here as it did after consolidation last summer and then again in the last quarter before we broke above 97, those were instances in which risk assets came under more pressure when those consolidations led to a breakout. Where do you stand on this cruiser? Do you think the dollar is reliable here? If we suddenly start jamming to highs, is it gonna throw the risk rally into question? Yeah, I mean, I think for the dollar, just where it's at right now, when you start to see the market, given the ebb and flow, and we've had day-to-day -day sentiment shifting almost, getting turned on its head, going from one side to the other. When you start to, to see, given the, the environment we're in, the range that the dollar, or really anything, will trade in as those headlines change, it, it gives you an idea of, all right, here's where we're at right now, given the, the ebb and flow of the situation, but you have to start asking yourself, well, what would it take then mm -hmm. um, for one of those to get so bad that it breaks it out? And that can happen either way, to the upside or the downside. What do you think breaks the dollar to the upside? A, a geopolitical shock? I, uh, think so. I think it would be a geopolitical What about 100 shock? basis points? What if they start talking up 100 for next meeting? I think either way, if you look at- 50 you know, first, then 100. Yeah, I think if- Hey, some analysts over the weekend said 75, right? You could have that, you could have that shock come from just more concern around uh, bad news coming out overseas. Um, you saw the, the yen, which I don't want to get too into the Forex world, but you saw the yen doing some pretty interesting things today when the uh, Bank of Japan made some announcements and some, some not expected um, statements on what they're going to be doing for policy. Things like that overseas can really cause a lot of demand um, coming into the dollar, and it's either a safe haven or they just want to get uh, invested into some sort of dollar-safe asset. But either way, I think a geopolitical shock could be really, really be what drives us further to the upside. The reason why that could push commodity prices lower is that geopolitical shock may likely also come with some strong uh, economic implications that are gonna in impact the demand outlook. And once again, that would be another thing that could push those commodity prices lower. Okay, uh, well said there, Cruiser. JB, I wanna give you one last one here, just real quick, we're almost out of time. Here's the Fed schedule this week. Tomorrow, Williams, Harker, Bostic, Wednesday, Barkin, Esther George, Thursday, John Williams, okay? Charles Evans, Friday. Does anybody here start talking 50 to 100 range for hikes? You get a couple 50, you get a couple 50s. I don't think you're gonna get 100, I think you get a couple 50s. I think they're gonna wait to see what happens on Friday for non-farm payroll, Albert. That's gonna be the big one, because that's mm. gonna be a driver, as well as some other data that comes out later this week. But I think you're here 50, nothing more than that. Great call, employment on Friday, gonna be a big one. He's not a Fed uh, voting member. However, Oliver Rennick's newsletter comes out on Wednesday. I will be making the case for a 100 basis point hike. Sign up, tdmeritradenetwork.com, the TD Market Minute. Seriously, I think you should do 100. Okay, Sean, JB, nice conversation, gentlemen. Good stuff, Sean Cruz, JB McKenzie, excellent uh, macro conversation here. Seriously, Wednesday, if you're not signed up, do it. I think you should hike 100 bips, get it out of the way. Okay, let's uh, talk some more of the big stories around the world when we come back. We need to talk some more about what's happening in China. After that huge relief rally on China's overture to its capital markets and tech giants, the stocks have gone nowhere. Let's walk through how to analyze a company's financials on Thinkorswim. To get started, go to the Analyze tab and select Fundamentals. Enter a symbol, then select Enter. To download detailed analyst reports, select Download. By the Numbers provides balance sheet information and other fundamental data. Company details provide summary takeaways on key metrics and what drives the stock takes a more numeric look at similar information. If you find any of the information particularly helpful, you can print it out or take a screenshot. For more demos on how to think or swim, head to the Education Center on tdameritrade.com. Technical traders, the chart master is in the building. Trends, support and resistance, key patterns and technical indicators. The chart master has your live technical analysis throughout the trading day, only on the TD Ameritrade Network. Kind of a weird day for Chinese markets where it seems the best explanation for crude, wheat, and commodities taking a nosedive is a halt of production and business in Shanghai as COVID spreads still. But then the FXI Big China ETF was up on the day. So was K-Web. 
What's going on? Let's bring in Hugh Roberts, head of analytics at Quant Insight. He's watching the Chinese stocks. And uh, Hugh, it's been a really interesting couple weeks, uh, but ever since that big relief rally, uh, when she announced some new lessening of oversight, these stocks have gone nowhere. Uh, so what happens next? Well, it's a really interesting point because the approach that we have at Quant Insight is exclusively macro. So we model a load of economic variables, economic growth, inflation expectations, Love it. credit spreads, strength of the dollar, that kind of stuff. And when that's not driving price action, it's down to some other kind of idiosyncratic risk. And obviously in the case of China, that's been about politics and the regulatory stuff. Mm. As you say, it feels now like the regulatory stuff has maybe pivoted a little bit and it's trying to become a bit more friendly. So if we can get a little bit of kind of uh, daylight on that side, that might mean that macro fundamentals come back into play. And certainly on our models, a lot of the bad news is now priced in. We're just, we have the most cheap valuations relative to model. What we're missing at the moment, to your point, is that catalyst that mm. just brings in the new marginal buying. The spark, uh, COVID shutdowns are certainly not gonna be a bullish spark it doesn't seem, but then again, tech companies sure did great during COVID, but has that trade run its course? What the heck is going on there? How have they not figured this thing out? Yeah, I think the, the COVID and the, the zero COVID policy clearly is not um, yeah. friendly. It's definitely a headwind, not a tailwind. I think actually the biggest variable that we should be watching for people who are kind of sharpening their pencils and looking to kind of get back into China exposure will be whether we see a more aggressive policy response from Beijing. They've started to flirt a little bit. We've had you know, a couple of marginal RRR cuts. Uh, there's been a little bit of stimulus um, in the banking sector, but it's nothing like we've seen in previous years, certainly after the global financial crisis, when, when you know, China really rode to the rescue of the rest of the global cycle. Um, we need to see something more aggressive, I suspect. If you're looking for a catalyst, I think it's gonna be the policy stance in Beijing. Does that policy stance pivot further away from our own central bank? Is uh, the Chinese central bank going to uh, take advantage of our rate hiking paradigm and present an alternative and say, come here, invest here. We got money still flowing out of the spigots. I wouldn't be at all surprised if that's one card they consider playing. Um, I think that is you know, something that they can definitely do. I mean, they, they seem reluctant because obviously the motivation behind the the red lines and the uh, the common prosperity and all the stuff we've been seeing for the last kind of 12, 15 months was to try and get in front of some of what they perceived to be kind of societal imbalances. You know, they didn't want big tech uh, running amok like they perceive it to do in the West. Um, they don't want a real estate bubble and the, the ructions that that's caused in the West. Um, so they're, they're trying to, to, to balance lots of things, but um, I suspect that explains why they've gone easy in terms of policy stimulus thus far. But I think the data is getting more and more of a nature where they're going to have to respond and respond harder. Mm. Uh, uh, Hugh, uh, walk us through some of that data in your model and some of those metrics you mentioned at the top, the macro stuff we were just talking about, currencies, inflation. How does that general picture look uh, compared to the U.S. Here, we've gotten a pretty clear message from Powell, for example. We know what to watch, right? We know he's really focused on employment. So as long as those numbers are hitting and inflation's above, we pretty much know his plan. What are the key data points to think about for China in trying to foresee what they will do? Yeah, just a quick one on the U.S. one. Our models are very interesting on the U.S. equities because I know there's lots of different um, narratives around trying to explain price action not just today but but the last 10 days yeah but actually we've had um we've got good explanatory power on spy on the queues or, or on russell um and we had them all as cheap for the last two weeks but mm. what's what's interesting is that as we've caught up in this rally is the drivers of the u.s equity market they actually they're comfortable with fed rate hikes on our showing on the current patterns as long as the Fed are measured, so if we go back to your, your, your last conversation, if we get a 75 or 100, then all bets are off. <laughs> but if they go in a measured way and they keep real rates negative and they don't prompt a big risk off move that sees VIX spike higher again and blows credit spreads up once more, that's actually a combination that works pretty well for U.S. equities at the moment. Mm. Um, and you've seen, I think, that, that, kind of act, that kind of climb the wall of worry almost price action is what's panned out over the last week and a bit.
do you think investors have to choose right now between U.S. stocks and international plays, uh, U.S. versus EM or U.S. versus China, and the uh, uh, trade around uh, China that many have said is overdue for outperformance? A lot of folks come into this year saying EM is going to be a great trade, but uh, it hasn't really outperformed too much, uh, and especially after this U.S. rally. Does it bring the money back home? What do you think that trade-off looks like here? I think you're absolutely right. I think the start of 2022, a lot of people's playbook, it was the end of American exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. And it was the year that after so many years of outperformance, the people were looking to divest overseas a bit more. Um, and I think that made a lot of sense, especially if you believed in the, you know, the kind of rotation, the value growth rotation. You know, the UK is always a great value play. Japan's a great value play. They have more financials, more resource um, names within the, uh, the headline indices. So I think in January, that was very much where the flow was going. Um, but listening to your earlier conversation, again, I think it, it ties up with the dollar conversation um, in terms of the capital flow there. And I think there's been a sharp unwind of the money that was going overseas and hoping that this might be the year that Western Europe, EM more broadly, frontier markets, if you're feeling particularly uh, punchy, all might have a little bit of a, of a run. But I think, you know, the... The commodity angle has obviously created some sharp winners and losers. It's just a clear transfer from energy producers to energy consumers. Mm. Ditto on the food side. Um, and in, in these situations, then, yeah, the, the, the dollar is still king. And, you know, people will, will, will vote with their feet. Uh, Hugh, before I let you go, just real quick, if we see the dollar follow the breakout in Treasury yields, does that get in the way of the stock rally? Or do we now have evidence they can all live in harmony? Yeah, it's interesting. So on our relationships at the moment, it depends very much on which sector you're looking at and the, the single names. But at the moment, a strong dollar is not a problem. The pattern that we're picking up, and we have a 12-month rolling history, and we use the dollar trade weighted in all our U.S. equity models, and a strong dollar at the moment is not a headwind. Mm. But that's something that we're going to be watching really closely. We update uh, intraday. We use daily frequency data. So we can spot these patterns changing, you know, flipping from positive to negative. So at the moment, it's, there's, there's no red light, but I agree totally. It's got to be a tail risk that should be on everyone's radar. Uh, Hugh, interesting conversation. Looking forward to more and looking forward to following up. Thanks for being here. Thank you. You got it, Hugh Roberts. Uh, joining us from Quant Insights. We got the chart master coming up next. Tomorrow, some very interesting earnings. Let's get ready for them. Chewy and Micron couldn't be more different, but lately, they have the similarity in that they've both been in declines, but Chewy, a much more problematic one. Let's see what Mr. Ducat thinks next. Trading isn't just a hobby. It's your future. So you don't lose sight of the big picture, even when you're focused on what's happening right now. And Thinkorswim is right there with you to help you become a smarter investor. With an innovative trading platform full of customizable tools, dedicated trade desk pros, and a passionate trader community sharing strategies right on the platform. Because we take trading as seriously as you do. Think or Swim by TD Ameritrade. Binge watch the market with TD Ameritrade Network. The dollar, interesting activity. So now I did some deep research into this. People are out of the house and engaging with the U.S. economy. Tune in 24 hours a day, seven days a week on tdameritradenetwork.com and all your favorite streaming services. You can also take us on the go with our CarPlay-enabled iOS app and our audio-only podcast. TD Ameritrade Network, available anytime, anywhere, on any device. All right, the chart master joins us, Mr. Rick Ducat, from the morning to the afternoon, giving us the technical look ahead to tomorrow. Chewy and Micron, Rick, let's start with Chewy. This chart's been pretty dicey. Yeah, it's been quite a slide down, Oliver. And, uh, you know, it, it was looking like we might have seen uh, an interesting development here. Check out point A, because it looks like to me that price started to break above uh, really convincingly more today than, than the other previous days started to break above this downward trend line that we've been seeing since the yearly highs in, in August. Um, more recently, also, we pushed above that 21-day exponential moving average. Today, it looked like we were perhaps stopping short at the orange 63-day uh, EMA, but price did close above it. Uh, so that's a more bullish development in this name. Looking at point B as well, 
54 was our recent highs and price also topped out at that 63 EMA there back in February as well. So that gives us a ceiling to look at for prices. Um, a little bit further below, we have a triple bottom uh, near 37 and we had a bullish crossover in the MACD recently. Okay, so this is a few things adding up to potentially uh, a, a breakout here. I mean, it's not much uh, at that A point, but it sure is the best it's had since the high. I mean, this is the furthest we've extended from that trend line. Yeah, very true. And uh, I would be worried about a false breakout here. You know, you got to really give it some time. You got to figure out some method for determining if the breakout's real, whether it's a percentage move beyond the, the boundary that you're looking at, whatever right. that may be, or uh, some other type of criteria that you use. Okay, I'd say uh, getting back above B, it feels like that's a, a really good way to assess the trend actually turning, right? Whether it's just a false breakout or real, uh, you know, uh, upward momentum through resistance levels, the point that you've got there for Chewy, uh, which is around uh, 50, uh, 54-ish or so. So we'll watch that, 53, 54, see if we can get there after earnings. What about Micron? Uh, Rick, uh, it's had an okay couple weeks, but not the standout for chips. People are a lot more interested in buying NVIDIA right now. Yeah, Micron's been really whippy, choppy prices, lots of big swings both up and down. Uh, more recently, look at point A. It looks like we bottomed out near the, the lower part of that line. Uh, and I, I created this channel just by drawing a, a, a trend line down across the highs and extrapolating it down by duplicating it. Um, so now this gives us both a very shallow upward trend line there in purple to work with, as well as a new floor near the 69 price level. Looking at point B next as well, uh, prices is not really able to crack that 21-day EMA yet. However, we did close above the 252-day EMA today. So that's something worth considering. The longer moving averages are more significant. It's another bullish sign that we were able to close above it. However, the 81 level really caught my eye too because that was where prices bottomed out twice uh, during December and January. Uh, and that seemed to be a place where prices topped out more recently, just about a week ago or so. Finally, okay. looking at point C, we had another of those bullish MACD crosses as well. So that's another sign to, to keep in mind. All right. So, uh, man, it, it's a pretty tough one. It, it, strangely enough, it's, it's almost like Chewy's got better momentum in this stock right now. Yeah, the momentum is not looking particularly strong uh, in this name either. We did have the bullish crossover, but we're still quite far away from that zero line, which would be the, the significant level as well for the, uh, the MACD to cross over. That would be another thing to watch out for. Okay, all right. Nice charts, Rick. A nice setup for tomorrow. Chewy looks like it's got a head start on earnings, and we'll see if it can get some follow through. Appetite right now for this market is very much geared towards buying beaten down trades. So Joey presents itself as one of those if earnings can live up to some expectations. Thanks, Rick. E chart master. Earnings tomorrow will hit them here live, of course, on Market on Close. But that's it for us here today. Your first trade begins in a moment. Great big bullish start to this week. Let's see what happens when the Fed speakers begin tomorrow. See you then, MTL, 8 a.m. Central Time. Whether you're an experienced investor or just getting started, TD Ameritrade offers a webcast that's right for you. The Platform Demo Webcast Series is designed to help you broaden your knowledge of tools and resources available from TD Ameritrade. You'll learn tips and tricks to help navigate tdameritrade.com, thinkorswim, and mobile-based platforms. Best of all, you can ask questions by chatting directly with an education coach. It's interactive learning at its finest. Tune in live or watch on demand. Head over to tdameritrade.com slash webcast and start learning today. I'm searching for info on options trading, and look, it feels like I'm just wasting time. That's why TD Ameritrade designed a first-of-its-kind personalized education center. Their award-winning content is tailored to fit your investing goals and interests, and it learns with you. So as you become smarter, so do its recommendations. So it's like my streaming service. Well, except now you're binge learning. See how you can become a smarter investor with a personalized education from TD Ameritrade. Visit tdameritrade.com slash learn.
90 minutes after the dust settles from the opening bell, Trading 360 brings you Wall Street's best traders, analysts, and technicians to give you a 360-degree perspective on markets. We focus on the hottest stocks, driving market headlines, and spotlight disruptive companies and new technologies exciting today's investors. Watch Trading 360 with Nicole Petalides weekdays at 11 a.m. Eastern on the TD Ameritrade Network. Many option traders tend to focus on price and direction, but implied volatility can also be a big factor in options trades. In the Options for Volatility course, we explore what implied volatility is and how it can potentially affect the price of an option. For example, let's say an option trader wants to take a bearish position on a stock, but isn't sure whether to buy a put or sell a call. Both strategies are bearish, but looking beyond direction to consider the impact of implied volatility could help the trader choose between them. We, al we also introduce strategies designed to harness changes in implied volatility. For instance, time spreads like counters and diagonals are designed to benefit from increases in implied volatility. Iron condors, on the other hand, are designed to benefit from falling implied volatility. After learning about the strategies, you can take the final assessment to test your knowledge. Head to the education tab on Thinkorswim for the full options for volatility course and a whole lot more. Welcome to your first trade. I'm Scott Connor a 30-year veteran trader, and it is Monday, March 28th. Now, we had a volatile session in the markets, but they, all four indices ended up in the green. We'll cover that a little bit later. But to start off the show, we're going to kick things off with Rick Ducat, and we're going to talk about an example trade based on restoration hardware. Now, that symbol is RH, and they have earnings coming out after the close Tuesday, tomorrow. So we'll put together an example trade that aligns with that earnings release. And then we're going to join Pat Mullally, and uh, review uh, an important strategy for options traders. And that, of course, is the calendar spread. And then we'll look at how a small tweak to a calendar spread can convert it into a diagonal. And then finally, I'll wrap up the action on Wall Street today and uh, talk about what was impacting the markets. We had some big moves in several names. You don't want to miss that uh, towards the end. Now, let's start at the very top and uh, turn our attention to an example options trade. And as I mentioned, we're looking at restoration hardware. Now, we are sort of at the end or the tail end of the earnings season, but there's still are quite a few names out there garnering attention. And that's why we're looking at restoration hardware. But before we get to the trade, let's do as we always do. Bring in the chart master and break down the charts of RH before going into a trade. Today, we've got, as I mentioned, Rich, Rick Ducat. Rick, thanks for joining us here uh, on your first trade to kick the week off. And... Uh, Again, there's just always a few names, Rick, that come out each week, and uh, this is one I think a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, the stock has come down significantly from its highs up in the mid-700s to the mid-300s. Rick, what are the charts telling you right now going into this uh, earnings release? Well, Scott, I wanted to start out with looking at a longer-term chart. I had a three-year, one-day chart uh, to highlight a few things that I thought were important. First of all, you said you know, this stock is down from the, the 744 level. So that means it's down about 47% off its yearly highs. It had an amazing rise off the COVID lows since then. So it's still, if you think about it that way, it's still quite elevated, even though we've had a, a very large decline. Uh, anecdotally, I'm just hearing from a lot of friends, they're trying to order furniture still. There's very long times for shipping. Uh, people have been waiting months for stuff they ordered. Uh, so there's still some some supply chain issues with this name as well. But the thing I really wanted to highlight here is check out that green line near 333. That's where prices bottomed out uh, back in eh, October 2020 or so. And that was right near where prices stopped uh, trending downward more recently. So these uh, these things are important to keep an eye on. We call them footprints of the market sometimes. There can be old support or resistance uh, from various price levels in the past. Now, from looking at our next chart here, uh, this is a a more shorter term chart. This is a one year, one day chart. And I wanted to start off by mentioning that we can see in the, sh the, uh, the intermediate term here, so much of 2022, we've been in a falling wedge type pattern. 
Uh, and this is typically regarded as a more bullish pattern. Uh, basically, though, it's it really can go either way. You don't want to be married to the idea that just because it's typically bullish, it's going to happen. Really, the important thing is to look for a breakout beyond either of the white lines there that I have uh, on our chart near point A. So this is also the point where prices are today. It's looking like we, we were able to finish above that yellow 21-day exponential moving average. And an exponential moving average is one that is weighted toward the more recent price action. A simple moving average, everything is equally weighted. But an exponential moving average tries to address some of the lag that's inherent in this uh, study. And uh, uh, so more recently now, we are looking at point B next. So 411 was the, the recent highs that we saw in this name. Uh, it's very close as well to the 63-day exponential moving average. So that would be a resistance point up to the top there. Checking with momentum on our MACD, we can see that we had a bullish crossover recently, but not really a lot of follow through in terms of either the price action or the momentum here. So it's kind of just uh, you know languishing a bit. Look for if we get some kind of big breakout out of this pattern, uh, look for uh, momentum to improve, look for these two lines to diverge more and still trend upward for some confirmation of a breakout, Scott. Got it, Rick. Now, I like the, the three-year chart and sort of going back to look at this important level. I want to just stress that one more time, that about 330 level I think you were talking about, going back uh, all the way to I think uh, 20, the end of 2019, right? So a little bit post-COVID, if you will, but nowhere near the highs. Um, as far as significance goes to someone maybe who's learning about charting, when you go back and see those, those previous uh, support levels, um, can you also think that you know, previously that was a resistance level and now, now it has become support, Rick? That's often how these things can work out. I mean, old support can become new resistance and vice versa. If we do break above this trend line, for example, uh, you know, you got to keep an eye on for whether it will come back to retest that level before resuming its upward trajectory. And I'm not saying that will happen. I'm just trying to give an example of how these things can work. Uh, you might find, uh, you know, for one, uh, like a triple bottom or a double bottom or something like that. It's a test of support multiple times. The more times a support area or resistance area gets tested and successfully holds, the more important it becomes going forward then. Got it. All right, well, that makes a lot of sense. All right, we'll keep that in mind going into our example trade uh, based on their earnings coming out Tuesday after the close. Thanks again, Rick. Uh, a pleasure having you here on your first trade. Hope to see you back. All right, thanks, Rick. All right, let's go back to the Thinkorswim trading software, go right to the trade tab. Now I put in the symbol RH, Restoration Hardware, and one of the things uh, I think that's interesting to look at is that when traders look at stocks, and oftentimes they try to figure, okay, well, what is the price right now compared to what it earned? In other words, what's the valuation of the company? Is it high, is it low? And that's what the PE ratio is, price over earnings. So they take the price of the stock, divide it by what it's earning or has earned over the last four quarters, and derive a, a, a number from there or a ratio. Now I'm looking at that number right now and you can see it's the PE ratio, price over earnings ratio, and it's 16, 16.8. All right, now the markets in general are more, more close to the 20 level, um, 19, 20, 21, that level. Uh, so you can see that this is not, in terms of valuing price to earnings, uh, highly overrated, if you were overvalued potentially, right? So again, that's a, an interesting takeaway, uh, particularly in light of the fact that the stock has come down $300 a share from where it was. Perhaps this PE ratio now is more uh, sort of normalized, if you will. So that's one interesting takeaway to add to, to Rick's charts. But let's start at the top, as we always do. So an example trade based on Earnings Tuesday. Let's start with time and price. Well, time's easy. We're going to use the options that expire this week. So you can see the April 1st expiration day. Uh, that's four days to go. Let's go ahead and open those up. And what is the expected move? Well, I'm going to move my mouse right now over the MMM, the market maker move, and that's 39079. Well, let's just tell you what. Let's just call it $40. So options are prices of options right now are sort of tell, letting us know that they're expecting about a $40 move up or down. Again, we don't know which direction, but that's an $80 wide spread. Now, if a trader was thinking the stock has come down a bit, and as Rick mentioned, already tested uh, that low around the 330 area, could it test it again? Sure. Could it go through it? Well, we don't know that either. But each time it does test and rebound, uh, as, as Rick mentioned, that potentially 
uh, gives us an idea that the stock is uh, potentially showing some strength bouncing off that number. But right now with the stock at 367, if we were to go 40 lower, that would take us down to 327. So let me go over to the put side and look at the strikes that are available. Well, I'm looking at the 325, for example. All right, the 325, 320 put spread. Now these are $5 wide spreads, keep in mind. The maximum value of that spread can be $5. Now if you sell a spread, you obviously don't want it to go to the maximum uh, value because that would be the maximum loss. But uh, what is it trading for? Well, let's see, 535, 440. So it looks like it's trading maybe somewhere around 90 cents to a dollar. Uh, so if a trader was thinking that the stock after earnings wouldn't be going below 325, which again is below the 330 support level that uh, Rick had pointed out on the chart, um, let's go ahead and see what, what would happen if we did this. Now, first, before we do that, let's see what the probability of the stock getting down there is, because I'm going to look at the probability of in the money column. It says 21.5. All right, so a fairly low probability of the stock getting down there, 79.5% chance that it won't, if you want to look at the inverse of the probability of being in the money. What's the probability of it staying out of the money? Well, then that's the exact opposite, 79. All right, 79%. So let's go ahead and sell the 325 put, hold down our control key, buy the 320 put. Now, again, we're selling this, it says about 95 cents. I'm just gonna make it an even dollar just to make our math easier. So by selling this for $1 on the limit price, let's hit confirm and send and take a look at the risk profile. Uh, and the risk, the maximum risk and m loss and gain. Now the maximum gain or profit would be the $100 credit received. That's $1 times 100, 100 is the multiplier. And the max loss would be 400. Well, that's easy because $5 is the width of the spread maximum width minus the 100. That leaves a 400 or $4 times 100, $400 risk to the downside. All right, well, tell you what, I'm gonna go ahead and send that one out, let it work. And uh, we'll keep our eyes on this tomorrow. Uh, and if the stock does move a little bit lower during the day, it would potentially increase the chance of that getting filled at those numbers, but uh, we'll keep a close eye on this one tomorrow. All right, that's our first example trade for the week based on restoration hardware. hardware. We'll have more as the week progresses, but stay with us because we're going to join Pat Mullally and talk about an important building block for options tra traders, and that, of course that is the calendar spread. Stay with us. We'll be back after this short break. Many option traders tend to focus on price and direction, but implied volatility can also be a big factor in options trades. In the Options for Volatility course, we explore what implied volatility is and how it can potentially affect the price of an option. For example, let's say an option trader wants to take a bearish position on a stock but isn't sure whether to buy a put or sell a call. Both strategies are bearish, but looking beyond direction to consider the impact of applied volatility could help the trader choose between them. We also introduce strategies designed to harness changes in implied volatility. For instance, time spreads like counters and diagonals are designed to benefit from increases in applied volatility. Iron condors, on the other hand, are designed to benefit from falling implied volatility. After learning about the strategies, you can take the final assessment to test your knowledge. Head to the education tab on Thinkorswim for the full options for volatility course and a whole lot more. 90 minutes after the dust settles from the opening bell, Trading 360 brings you Wall Street's best traders, analysts, and technicians to give you a 360 degree perspective on markets. We focus on the hottest stocks, driving market headlines, and spotlight disruptive companies and new technologies exciting today's investors. Watch Trading 360 with Nicole Petalides weekdays at 11 a.m. Eastern on the TD Ameritrade Network. Opportunities can be hard to find, like catching lightning in a bottle. In uncertain times, it's tempting to retreat or simply wait and see. At CME Group, we empower those who act. We deliver tools to help manage risk and capture opportunities in every market climate, across every major asset class, to seize each possibility at precisely the right moment. CME Group, opportunity is everywhere. Welcome back to Your First Trade. I'm Scott Connor. Now let's turn our attention to the world of options trading. And today, we're going to review the traditional calendar spread and then look at a variant of that known as the diagonal spread. Now you'll learn about the mechanics of the calendar spread and how it can align with different directional outlooks. 
You'll also see how the calendar risk profile can be tweaked by embedding a vertical spread into uh, the, the traditional calendar to create what's called a diagonal. Now, to join me to discuss calendar spreads and, uh, and diagonals as well is your first trade contributor, Pat Mullally. Pat, thanks for joining us here again on your first trade. And Pat, I thought it was a, a good way to kick things off here with uh, talking a little bit about the calendar spread because it's been a little while. And, and Pat, you and I both know that uh, the calendar spread, of course, is an important building block for all complex strategies. Uh, so maybe let's start off uh, at the top there. Let's give a definition to our viewers, Pat, of what do we mean by, by calendar spread? Absolutely, Scott. And building block, this is a very important term that you need to understand between calendars and verticals because that's all there is in, when we're talking the complex spread. So a calendar spread is a defined risk option strategy, Scott. Now it's constructed by buying and selling the same strike price option, calls or puts, but at different expiration dates. Now, Scott, this is often referred to as a time or a horizontal spread. Now, typically a longer dated option is purchased and a shorter term option is gonna be sold. Now, depending on the strike selected, a calendar spread can be either bearish, it could be bullish or neutral, Scott. So it's very important that people understand that this is very uh, forgiving and, and, uh, and something that needs to probably be in everybody's toolbox. Got it, Pat. So a good takeaway there is that uh, sometimes it's called a time spread because just think about it, you're buying one call strike, uh, let's say, for example, uh, two months away and then selling the same strike call uh, maybe one month away. So again, it's same strike, but different time. That's a good takeaway. Well, let's keep talking about the characteristics of the calendar spread and, and potentially why it's different than the other building block that you mentioned, Pat, the vertical spread. Sure, absolutely. So. In buying and selling that same strike at different dates, the calendar is going to take on some unique characteristics, Scott. Now, first, it has increased sensitivity to changes in implied volatility. And as you may recall, the Greek vega is going to measure an options price change in relation to changes in implied volatility. And the longer dated options in general are going to be more sensitive to those changes in volatility than shorter dated options. Now, since we're buying longer dated and selling shorter dated, on balance, the calendar is vega positive and benefits if, if that volatility rises during the lifetime of that trade, Scott. Okay, so another important, uh, unique characteristic is its sensitivity, as you mentioned, to changes in implied volatility. But that makes sense, Pat, because if you look at a vertical spread, the, the long option and the short option all expiring at the same time, right? So they're kind of under the same influences in terms of volatility. But when you buy a longer dated option, it's more sensitive to changes in volatility than that short dated option. So Pat, Pat makes perfect sense. All right, well, let's, uh, let's tell you what, let's go to the next step here. And as, we, as you know, Pat, we always try to think in terms of risk profile shapes for the different verticals, uh, different spreads or strategies, I should say. And Pat, you know that uh, the Z shape for the vertical spread is one that we, I think we've got firmly embedded in our minds, Pat, but uh, what should we know about the risk profile of a calendar spread? Yeah, calendar spread, Scott, is gonna be similar to that butterfly spread that you show often, which is gonna resemble a witch's hat shape, you know, with a P. Now, like the butterfly, Scott, the, uh, uh, the trader wants that underlying stock to go right to that peak, right to that short strike price. Ideally, of course, at the time, of that options expiration date. Got it. So think of it kind of like the butterfly, sort of like that that comes to a peak um, and uh, we want it to go to the peak on the expiration day. Now, again, since we have different expiration dates, of course, the emphasis there, I, I think is important to reiterate. It's the short term, the, one, the option that expires first. That, <laughs> Pat, that's the one we want it to go to, that strike. But again, it's the same strike for a calendar, so uh, it should be almost redundant there. Now, let's, uh, let's tell you what we'll do. Let's take a quick look uh, at, a, at, a, at a profile uh, of a, just a typical calendar spread. And what, Pat, what I'm gonna do is jump into the Thinkorswim platform here now and go right to the trade tab. Uh, I have Apple in there, I was watching it earlier. We'll, just, we'll go ahead and keep that. And tell you what, we'll look at the expiration dates and tell you what, we'll buy a call, Pat, that expires oh, in early May. So 53 days from now, and then maybe we'll sell a call that uh, expires in 25 days, all right? So a good, good distance between those two, almost 20 day difference between the two expirations. 
Uh, all right, so the stock is currently about 175, Pat, so I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the 180 stripe uh, and highlight that. So I'm going to buy the 180 call, so just click on the ask price, and there you go. You can see buying the call that expires here, uh, the 180 call that we just bought here, expiring in 53 days. Now I'm going to scroll down and let's look at the other one that I opened, the one that expires, uh, it's not open now, but let me open it up, in 25 days. Now. Again, we're selling the same strike, so I'm going to hold down my control key, hold down the control key, and sell the 180 call that expires uh, much sooner. And now you can see it says right there, calendar spreads. We're buying the 180 call that expires in May and selling the 180 call that expires in April. And it looks like we're paying, Pat, I'm just going to round this, about $2.90. So what I'm going to do is we always do, right click on that order. We're not sending the order out, we just want to analyze it. So let's go to Analyze Trade. And that will take us to the risk profile. And I have to make sure that I'm hiding any positions that are already exist in Apple. That's a very important step. Don't forget that one. Now take a quick look. So here's the stock, as we mentioned, right here, Pat, right about that 175, 176 level. But the peak of this, like that uh, witch's hat, sort of you were talking, would be 180, right? And that is, of course, the strike that we looked at. So if it did go there, you can see that would be the, the highest potential reward. Now the losses would be if it were to go well below that or well above that and that peak would, that maximum loss would do it, would peak out at the cost of the calendar, $2.90 or $290. All right. Now let's talk a little bit more about the, the calendar spread itself. When, when would a trader potentially consider this type of strategy, Pat? Well, you know, it's, it's really kind of depends on how directional they are like this. This is more bullish because mm -hmm. we're waiting for price to make it to the peak. So what we see from this risk profile is this particular trader would have seen that defined risk element, uh, uh, you know, with the width of the profitable area at the break evens where that max gain is actually uh, a bit more bullish. Now, if they thought they were looking for uh, a more bearish, then they may look at put uh, put uh, options in that case. Now, when can traders also consider that directional outline, uh, outlook is if the overall volatility levels are relatively low and then that calendar spread may be the logical choice, Scott, from a directional as well as volatility level. Got it. So in this case, uh, we're picking the 180 strike, which is a little bit higher, so it would be bullish in outlook and uh, perhaps also anticipating perhaps a little bit of a, a move higher in vo implied volatility. Uh, and again, that would align with this particular strategy. Now, Pat, we just have a minute left. Let's talk a little bit about how does a, a calendar become a diagonal, Pat? Exactly. So all we're going to do is modify that calendar by using slightly different strikes, which is going to result in that diagonal spread. Remember, when changing any option strike to a different uh, to a different strike that essentially a trader is going to be dropping that vertical, dropping a vertical spread onto the original strike. This concept is going to be important, Scott, especially in understanding the change to risk reward parameters when tweaking calendar strikes to create that diagonal. Got it, Pat. I'm just going to jump back to the uh, risk profile, change it from calendar uh, to custom. And uh, I'm going to change again, like you mentioned, uh, you, I'm going to drop a vertical spread on the short call. So a vertical spread simply would be selling the, uh, buying the 180 back and then selling the 185. Of course, that's, that's basically dropping a, a vertical spread. So I'm just going to change this to, uh, as we mentioned, 185. And you can see that definitely changes the shape. Uh, uh, as far as the upside, you can see that uh, there's a lot more room on the upside for potential profit, but there is now a larger potential loss on the downside. So this has been tweaked, but like you said, it's uh, much more uh, situate or suited for a rally and there's a greater risk to the downside because the cost of this now is $4.19 because you effectively added a long vertical call spread to it. So kind of an interesting way to think about that tweak. Uh, it should be uh, more bullish because again, to change that strike, we had to add a long vertical call spread to that strike. So it makes sense. Pat, sorry, we got to wrap it up there. This is a great topic and uh, gives our, I think our viewers a lot to think about here, uh, how a calendar uh, can become a diagonal. Pat, always a pleasure having you here. I look forward to seeing you again on your first trade. Thanks, Pat. All right, coming up next, we're going to wrap up the day on Wall Street. A lot happened today. Stay with us. We'll break it all down after this break. Watchlist can help you keep track of securities you're interested in. 
To add a watch list to the left sidebar, select the plus sign, then watch list. When the default list appears, select the name box, then create watch list. Enter a watch list name. To begin adding securities, enter a ticker symbol in the symbol box, then select enter. Continue adding all the symbols you want in your watch list, then select save. The existing list is replaced by the new one. You can also create watch lists from the market watch tab. After creating a watch list, you can add symbols to it from different locations across the platform. From the charts tab, select the list icon and then add to watch list. From the scan tab, right click a security and then add to watch list. And that's how you make a watch list. For more demos on how to think or swim, head to the Education Center on tdameritrade.com. Welcome back to Your First Trade. I'm Scott Connor. Now it is time for the wrap on this Monday, March 28th. Well, after two consecutive weeks of gains of the major indices, they started off a little choppy. Didn't look like maybe we were going to hold that same pattern this week, but markets did rally towards the end. We saw basically all four indices in the green. Uh, to put things in perspective right now, if you go back two Mondays ago, S&P 500 is up almost 10%, 9.8, and the NASDAQ up 15% just two weeks ago Monday. So all four indices up today, as you can see, S&P up uh, 7 tenths of a percent, Dow Jones up a quarter percent, NASDAQ definitely the strongest up one and a half percent, and of course the Russell unchanged, but we'll put that in the green column. So that's what the markets did. Now, what else happened today? Very important moves today we saw in oil. If you look at forward slash CL, we saw oil drop. Uh, ten and a half dollars, that's a nine, almost a nine and a half percent drop. And that sort of lessened some of the inflation fears that we saw or have been seeing and concerning the market. So that gave a little bit of, of, of uh, good news or relief to the markets, if you will. Now, if you look at forward slash RB, which is gasoline, you can see that was down significantly as well, down to three dollars and 15 cents a gallon. Uh, again, hopefully that will pass on to the pumps here soon for all of us consumers. And finally, what about gold? Gold was weak today as well, down $32 a share, uh, I'm sorry, an ounce, uh, down to 1921. So all down across the board. Now, what about the 10-year yield? That's something we've been watching closely as the Fed talks about raising interest rates to take on inflation. Well, we saw a three-week run in the 10-year uh, 10 yield up to 2.5%, but today backed off just a little bit. Not a lot, but down slightly uh, on the day. 10-year yield down to 24 Seven. Uh, what else have we been watching? Bitcoin forward slash BTC. Now this has been on a move higher today. A tremendous move, breaking the 2022 resistance that it's tested several times, breaking through that and closing above 48,000 for the first time uh, in a while. You have to go back to early, I think, January to see those levels. So uh, Bitcoin definitely taking on some uh, uh, and so, some, some interest for long-term investors. What about the VIX, the fear index? Well, that was down today as well. That broke below 20. Now, last time that happened was on January 14th, closed at 1964 today. So definitely with the, uh, uh, the rally in the markets after two weeks, we're starting to see some of the concern come out of the marketplace. Now, what about stocks and sectors today? Well, we had some big moves back and forth. Let's start off with consumer discretionary, which really led the way today. Some of the big names there, uh, Tesla uh, having a tremendous rally today, uh, followed by Amazon, which showed some gains. We also had uh, Chipotle and Home Depot. And uh, we also saw some positivity in the cruise lines. CCL Carnival up almost 5.5% on the day. Take a look at that Tesla move up $81 to 1091 uh, Again, uh, all it sounds like all good news. We'll talk a little bit more about Tesla in, the, in a minute. But where did we see weakness today? Well, we have to go to the energy sector with oil down $10 uh, a barrel. No surprise to see some of the names down uh, in the energy sector. Uh, pretty much weak across the board. Any, any stock that you actually go to uh, in the, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, energy sector, we saw moves down to two, three, and 4%, a lot of those, those names there. So definitely weakness there. Now, what about individual names? Well, Apple was in the news today uh, and uh, talked a little bit about a potential shutdown in China due to the COVID restrictions that are happening. Uh, also, there was talk about them cutting production almost to the 20% level for Q2. So again, uh, a little bit of uh, weakness there. The stock still was up slightly on the day, but uh, 
again, didn't participate like some of the other names. Now, Tesla, we also mentioned showing tremendous strength today. That's based on an announcement today that they will uh, uh, ask for a, 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 another stock offering, which they'll use that money to uh, split the stock and pay a dividend. So a lot could be happening with Tesla here. We'll follow that closely. In terms of international da or data today, international trade and goods is the, really the only item that caught our attention and uh, not much there, pretty much in line. But remember, throughout the week, we've got GDP, personal income, and the big jobs number on Friday. Well, that's going to do it for the wrap here today. Thanks again. We'll see you tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. The analyst said increasing competition, lowered at McDonald's, will weigh on the stock. And Morgan Stanley downgraded Citigroup to underweight, lowering its price target to $60, down from $75. The analyst cited a lack of near-term catalysts and the negative impact of deglobalization. Now let's take a look at the uh, futures products here. We've been watching, you know, Bitcoin's right now closer to 48,000 at 47,935, gaining 7%. U.S. dollar, 99.25, gaining slightly. Gold, 19.35 a troy ounce, down 1%. Crude oil at 104.76 the barrel, down 8%, continuing that correction that we've seen. And the VIX at 23.90, gaining about 2%. Let's get some insights on the news shaping the markets, and for that, we welcome in Kevin Gordon, Senior Investment Research Manager at Charles Schwab. Kevin, thanks so much for being on with us. Our first guest, we're live from the New York Stock Exchange with our finger on the pulse of the market. I'm glad that you're able to be with us today. So what are your thoughts here on the market with only the NASDAQ holding on today uh, after two weeks of gains? Well, we still think that near term, at least, the, the market's going to be more driven by sort of the short term headlines that are associated with Russia, Ukraine. But now coming more into the picture, which, you know, unsurprising given what's going on with rates and the fact that the Fed has moved off the zero bound, that the Fed's going to be a lot more important, particularly because they've focused so much on the inflation component of the mandate. And the employment part has, has largely been satisfied. So I think now we're having to digest both of these you know, fairly large factors that are, that are moving in the market, but it's coming into clearer focus as some of the data starts to weaken. So whether it's housing related with mortgage rates moving up pending home sales rolling over uh, for, for four straight months in a row now, um, or if it's something like, you know, a broader metric like GDP, which for the Atlanta Fed and the measure that they do, which is, which is an outcasting model, so it takes the data as it's coming in, uh, that's rolled over a little bit too. It's, it's less than a one handle. So, you know, we could see some more weakness in the, in the first quarter, driven primarily by a sagging, you know, in an inventory growth. Consumption is still pretty strong, but, you know, still even, even getting to, you know, closer to the zero line for GDP growth is still nothing to, to look away from. So I think now with the Fed embarking on a tightening cycle, some of the data coming in weaker, but inflation still keeping, you know, uh, staying at a pretty elevated rate, 
that's now giving us a, a sense that we're in much more of a counter cyclical inflation environment again. And I think that's going to you know, continue to drive market volatility in addition to what's going on geopolitically, too. Right, absolutely. You know, and a lot of people have been throwing around uh, different words from stagflation to recession and some concerns there. But, um, you know, there are some good points in the market. But, you know, what about the, the talk of recession? If the Fed moves too fast, things like that, um, are you watching anything like that? Well, we're not, uh, you know, we put out a report last week, my boss, Lizanne Saunders, and I, and talking about recession risk, and it's not too, you know, it's not too early to be discussing it, just because we are moving from an environment of easier financial conditions into tighter financial conditions, or if you want to think of it from accommodative to more restrictive monetary policy. And, you know, historically, when that's the case, you just get closer to the end of a business cycle. And now that we're you know, in an environment of higher energy prices that are moving up at a, at a pretty rapid pace, you have yield curves that are getting close to inversion territory. That's much more the 10-year, two-year yield spread versus the 10-year, three-month, which is a little bit more reliable as it pertains to timing with, with recessions in general. But given all of those factors and the fact that consumer confidence has sunk like a stone, particularly if you're looking at a metric like the University of Michigan, we just have to start dusting off the playbook and see you know, what, what is it typically, what are the dominoes that have to fall for us to get into a recessionary environment? I think the timing is always tough. Nobody can accurately predict when we're going to get one. But, you know, a, enough of a slowing in activity, such as we've seen in some of the metrics that are key, especially those that are leading in nature, it just warrants a little bit of a look back at history and, you know, what might suggest that we get closer to the end of the business cycle. But all that being said, this is a really tough cycle to assess. It always has been since the onset of the pandemic. So I don't think that we can perfectly apply what's been, you know, what's played out in history and use that as a, you know, prognostication moving forward. Right, overall. And so with this jobs report on Friday, tell me what the expectations are. You know, there's always the whisper numbers and then there's reality. Yeah, I think, well, you know, it's probably good. The expectation, at least, is for it to be pretty strong. And I, for us in particular, we've been really hyper-focused on metrics, more of the sub-metrics like labor force participation. And even when you get within that rate and you break it down, looking at the age cohorts and then among gender, just to make sure that it's broad-based and that enough people are coming back into the labor force, you don't have sort of the great resignation theme holding anymore. Uh, so that's going to be a pretty big focus for us. And then other metrics like the unemployment rate, which even though it is among the most lagging economic indicators and, you know, broadly, it's certainly the most lagging labor market uh, indicator. We want to, you know, see if there's any movement there. And then in conjunction with earnings, too, a, a metric like average hourly earnings is getting a little bit easier to assess as we move off of the base effect era of, of the pandemic. We're no longer being skewed as much by, you know, the the areas like leisure, hospitality, and retail that were, you know, excluded from the workforce, they have now started to come back in. So we can get a little bit of a better sense of what actual wage growth looks like in the face of higher inflation. Uh, but as I mentioned at the opening of the show, the labor component for the Fed has, you know, at this point largely been satisfied. So it would probably take a pretty dismal report, um, either at the headline payroll level or even an uptick in the unemployment rate for them to sort of reassess what they, you know, have mapped out moving forward, at least in the near term as it pertains to, to rate hikes. Right. And as investors have been um, seeing some growth, uh, at least in their portfolios, with two weeks of gains for the S&P Nasdaq, and the Dow, um, you are you are with some concern about the recent rally. You know whether or not it really truly has legs and growth investing versus you know value investing or looking for dividends plays that might be a little safer. Yeah, it hasn't been the the healthiest rally. A lot of it has been a mix of short covering and then areas that got hit really hard uh, in the initial you know drop phase. So the you know the high volatility, high beta, high momentum areas those have been leading the market higher. And you know for us at least, we'd like to see broader participation, especially among high quality areas. Because if you look back historically, I know we can't apply it perfectly, but when we go into tightening cycles, when we get later into the business cycle, uh, you know closer to the end than we are to the beginning or the middle. High quality just outperforms. That, that's just you know the case, especially when you get into a, a tighter financial condition scenario or environment. So that's been our you know call that we've liked to stick with because over the past six months or even year to date, that's still been the area of consistent leadership. And you were talking about sort of yield plays or defensive areas in nature, an area that's actually done pretty well 
uh, you know, recently is utilities. So the utilities index itself within the S&P 500 has hit an all-time high. Uh, you know, going back to 1990, that's when we have the data. But if you look at you know the the sector's expense on a forward PE basis, it's more expensive than the S&P 500. So it's defensive, but and even though it lives in you know value indices like Russell 1000 value or Russell 2000 value, you're still paying a lot more than you would be for the broader market. So that's why we don't like to just put blinders on and, and look at one sector and say there is where you find defense uh, in you know in an environment when the the markets and you know just more highly volatile. You want to be sort of broadening that out and look for high quality across sectors. Yeah. And you know what else I was thinking about just now is how we've had this correction in oil, right? Whereas we're seeing this pullback in oil for several reasons. Um, and that might be at least a bit of a relief. But on the other side of the coin, we've seen yields moving higher, right? So you have the 10 year Treasury at two and a half percent. So what are your thoughts on some of these push pull events? Well, I think between the three, if you just look at stocks, bonds, commodities, that's enough to sort of put your, you know, have, have, have you to put on a neck brace because of not, not just the vol volatility in commod the commodity space itself, maybe just excluding that. If you just look at stocks and bonds, they become much more tightly correlated from a price perspective. So this quarter, uh, you know, when you look at the drawdown for the S&P 500, if you want to use that as the, the proxy for the equity market, and then just the maybe aggregate U.S. bond market, uh, they've both been decisively weak. And that's our concern if this does become more protracted and if we are entering an environment where we're a little bit more prone to supply shocks than demand shocks, much like was the case in the 70s and the 80s, not saying that we return to a stagflation environment, but if we get in back into a scenario when stock prices and bond yields are negatively correlated, that means that rising yields, that environment of rising yields will be more negative for equity prices. And so, you know, in an environment also with, you know, the commodity aspect, when you have oil prices staying elevated, but also moving up, uh, whether it's to the upside or the downside in double digit fashion over the past, you know, on a rolling five day period basis, which is what we've been seeing. Um, that's enough to sort of, you know, keep investors uh, sort of spinning around and looking for areas to hide in. And that's why, you know, back to the factor approach, that's why it's worked so well. That's why you found consistency there. So I think between those three asset classes and all the volatility that we've seen, if it doesn't die down, then you want to keep that factor based approach. Good to see you, Kevin. Thank you so Thanks, much. Nicole. Kevin Gordon, Senior Investment Research Manager at Charles Schwab. Thanks for being with us. Plenty more to come right here on Trading 360, live from the New York Stock Exchange. NYSE Senior Market Strategist Michael Ranking will be with us and join us right here on the floor. We'll have a discussion on the market action, rising yields, recapping earnings season, and much more. And Roku is today's disruptor. Tom White will join us with all the details and a way to trade it as well. And later, a quick look here at those travel stocks, our 360 round. Our panel is ready to look at names such as Booking and Expedia. But up next, it's the big three. Three stocks, three charts, three trades. Ben Lichtenstein goes to the technicals. Scott Nations from Nations Indexes takes us through the trades for Deer, Exxon Mobil, and Netflix. Next, here on Trading 360, live from the NYSE. Technical traders, the chart master is in the building. Trends, support and resistance, key patterns and technical indicators. The chart master has your live technical analysis throughout the trading day, only on the TD Ameritrade Network. Whether you're an experienced investor or just getting started, TD Ameritrade offers a webcast that's right for you. Looking to improve your portfolio management skills? Our portfolio management webcast series breaks down key concepts like retirement planning, income generation, ETFs, and more. Best of all, you can ask questions by chatting directly with an education coach. It's interactive learning at its finest. Tune in live or watch on demand. Head over to tdameritrade.com slash webcasts and start learning today. Thinkorswim Trading equips you with customizable tools, dedicated trade desk pros, and a passionate trader community sharing strategies right on the platform. Because we take trading as seriously as you do. Thinkorswim Trading from TD Ameritrade.
Oh, yeah, I'm gonna take off. Now, you downloaded the TD Ameritrade mobile app? Yeah, actually, I'm taking one last look at my dashboard before we board. And you have Thinkorswim Mobile? So I can finish analyzing the risk on this position. You two are all set. Choose the app that fits your investing style. Welcome back to Trading 360. I'm Nicole Petalides, live in New York City, live from the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for being with us. It's time for the big three. Three stocks, three charts, three trades. Ben Lichtenstein will take us through the charts. Here to take us through the trades is Scott Nations, president at Nations Indexes. Scott, I'm glad you're here with us. You've been talking about deer for some time. Um, you know, it's been a winner, and you're talking about how to add to a winner, right? Tell us more, Scott. That's right, Nicole. Last time I was on, I suggested buying deer because while we are all rightly worried about inflation, Deer is just the, the poster child for those companies that love inflation. So farmers are in great shape. Crop prices are at all time highs. They're gonna uh, put even more land into production. They're gonna put marginal land in production. What's that mean for deer? It means that farmers have lots of money. They have reason to spend it. They're gonna be able to spend it. And as I said, that's wonderful for deer. So last time I was on, I suggested buying it when it was in the 380 range. And Nicole, now I wanna do something that, that a lot of traders don't do, and it's really tough to do well, and that's add to a winner. So I wanna to add to my position in deer. I would buy a half a unit. Anytime I could buy it below, say, $430 a share. So it needs to come, as you can see, it needs to come in at least another $2. But at that level, I would be happy to add to a winner. I think I'd be adding to it really well. And I think deer is gonna to continue to do incredibly well given everything we see as uh, regarding inflation. Yeah, and Ben, what do you think as you take a look at this chart? I mean, Scott made the point that he did pick this one some time ago and it's continuing its run higher. Your thoughts on the chart, Ben? You know, guys, good morning. I remember specifically the day that we looked at this chart and some of the levels I was talking about. So again, Scott, I was happy to revisit this one. And if I remember correctly at the time, I had mentioned how we were starting to see a little bit of a big comeback in a play, which was encouraging for the Bulls. And I mentioned how 320 was a key level. I thought 350 was going to be key as well. We wanted to hold that support. And here, I want to show you, we didn't hold 350 as earnings came out. Again, we're talking about middle of February. We started to see some weakness down of the 320 level, but then again, recovered nicely. We spent a very limited amount of time down here. And in fact, this turned out to be a bit of a V bottom. So we always talk about how Again, you, you're uh, seeing new levels. You need to then look at the kind of a if then situation here. If you do break out, then what should happen? In this case, we should form value or overlapping rotational price activity, a lower level we didn't. We rejected that. And look, it's been off to the races since. Now, again, I mentioned the 350 level I thought was key, but at the time we had this double bottom, which had formed around 320. And so I mentioned if we got below 350, keep an eye on that. And look, it held. And again, as mentioned in a big way, We've now got price activity above the 50 per day moving average, this blue line, back above the 200. RSI a little overextended, so I like in terms of what Scott was talking about as far as a pullback to the 430 level, ultimately, because that is a bit of a lower extreme of a range that we're kind of in right now as we now accept this new area of value at upper level. I do want to point out, year to date, this stock's almost up 26%. I mentioned RSI a little bit overdone. We have seen some volume come into play here. Now, take a look at this chart, the weekly, because what I'm wondering, Scott, and you might know a little bit better in terms of your familiarity with this stock, but as far as my familiarity with price activity, I'm sort of looking at this range right now that we're breaking out of to the upside, almost like what we saw back in, well, we're talking the end of the summer and into the end of 2019 and throughout the beginning of 2020 prior to that breakout up. Look, we've got a vertical move up, higher highs and higher lows. We saw the same thing back in uh, beginning of August of 2020 and again you can see how well in this instance we didn't really slow down and we didn't find a stopping price till we're talking the fall of that year where we've kind of consolidated around 250. I guess what I'm wondering is if this is a similar situation that's starting to stack up here. Uh, I think investors should be looking for higher highs and higher lows, energy, follow through, directional conviction to the upside here and then again we want to at some point see a new area of value form at this higher level. We don't want to see a V-top type pattern rejection of this and kind of work our way back into that range that we just broke out of. We want to see acceptance of this new price activity at the upper level. Basically the opposite of what we saw as we rate traded back down to 320 the last time. Yeah, and Scott, what do you think of that as we see that conviction, at least for this part, before we move to the next name on the list? Your final thoughts here on Deer. 
Well, the last time I was on with it was in was within just the last few weeks. And I think that what we've seen in commodity prices, particularly what we saw in wheat futures, changes the dynamic for John Deere to a substantial degree. I, um, I, I noticed that, and Ben is right, we have higher highs and higher lows. But I actually think that the levels that we saw last summer for Deere are now nearly irrelevant because of what we've seen in commodity prices. That changes the paradigm for John Deere completely. Mm, okay, that being said, let's change what stock we're looking at. And we'll look now to your next name, and that is ExxonMobil. Of course, we've had the jump in oil. It's since pulled back some. But you're looking at some of the other the things that will be fundamentally probably some good news, such as travel, reopenings, things like that. Tell me more. Well, and Nicole, you know, when we look at oil, we think that anything that has to do with energy is helped by higher oil prices. And for the integrated names, that's just not the case. So I'm looking at ExxonMobil, one of the integrated uh, energy companies. And why is that not necessarily the case? It's because when they have a retail arm, they see their retailing margins pressured when they have to, when, when oil prices increase. And so what often happens for the integrated names is they'll actually accept lower margin at the pump simply because they want to maintain market share so the pullback that we've seen is actually great news for ExxonMobil because now they're going to be able to expand margins at the pump. They're going to get a lot of money for all of the crude oil that they produce. So this is this is really the best sort of scenario for a company like ExxonMobil. Uh, I would be accumulating it below $83 a share. This is a situation, Nicole, where I'd be pretty greedy with the way I executed this trade. So if I wanted to put in a bid at, say, 82 even and maybe another one, 81 and a half, and I bought some of that, uh, I, I would feel really good. I would feel really good about both my execution and my position. Ah, okay. So he's really looking at specific levels where to get in here, Ben, when it comes to ExxonMobil. What are your thoughts when you take a look at this chart? What do you see? Uh, this is a stock that I see rallying strongly into the beginning of the year, but since then it's been a bit more sideways in a wide range here, and basically from 91 down to 76 now. What concerns me a little bit at this level is we're starting to roll over and again between 76 and 91 that's kind of in that range of the middle area of balance that I like to look for and if we roll over here we're kind of failing to get anything going through the middle of that range after uh, a failed attempt at the lower extreme so again it's just not a lot of directional conviction here as of right now but you can see the nice move up to begin the year and then again you can see this overlapping this more rotational type price activity we do have a well-defined upper and lower extreme to keep an eye on at this point but let's take a step back from the hourly take a look at the daily time frame you can see again the well-defined trend we were just looking at here actually again this is well basically uh, the area that we were looking at from 60 up to 91 you can see that that's just a small part of the large degree trend we've seen we're holding above the 50-day moving average we haven't been below the 200 days since the fall of 2020 and again you got to go all the way back to these levels we've tested it a couple times but we haven't been convincingly below since the fall of 2020 and you know i think uh the the weekly is really where this gets most interesting here in terms of i would say when in doubt zoom out and i'm just not seeing a lot of directional on the hourly again or even that much on the daily you do see that well-defined trend but just kind of in this zone we're in right now but you know we've held this range uh, uh, we're now working our way into the middle of this range here so I think this is key again while we've kind of stalled out on the hourly time frame that's a bit of a disappointment for the bulls but if we could regain composure and now kind of work our way up through the 9100 I think from a very strictly technical basis here it could open up the door for some upside potentially or obviously I'd be watching the price of crude if I was trading Exxon and uh, some of these other energy names and in fact now that I think of it crude's kind of stalled out at these levels too in a bit of a range after recently topping out around 130 so again Again, not a proxy obviously but a lot of contributing factors as Scott just mentioned here but uh, again I, I think unfortunately in this one not as much well-defined directional conviction one way or the other is in terms of what we were just seeing for example uh, as far as the move up in deer yeah Scott what did you think of that chart that Ben was just highlighting as he took a look at the weekly versus the longer period um, and the moving averages. Um, as you talk about your entry point in those low 80s levels, what did you think about that chart? Well, I think Ben is right, it, that there's not necessarily a lot of conviction right now. And that's why I think that I can be a lot more greedy when it comes to my execution here. And that is, you know, put, put some bids below the market. I, I would be much more emphatic with adding to deer than I would 
uh, buying Exxon Mobil because of the, for the very reasons that that Ben has mentioned out has mentioned technically, but also fundamentally the picture for for Exxon Mobil. While I think it's positive, particularly as we all start to travel again, uh, but in the shorter term, the 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 picture is a little bit more muddled. And so again, we can we can let the market come to us. Hmm. Right, right. Understood. And last but not least, I wanted, as we just came off the Oscars last night, Netflix got a lot of nominations, even though Apple TV took the, the best, uh, the big show, right, the big win, but Netflix did well. Tell me a little bit about your final trade here, because a lot of folks, when they like Fang, they don't like Netflix necessarily, Scott. Why is that, do you think? What do you think? You're right, Nicole. We just got off the Oscars, and streaming has finally broken through. And that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, so there's some wonderful content on the streaming services. But the problem with Netflix, Nicole, is while, while they are the first mover, and they have a wonderful first mover advantage, they are spending a tremendous amount of money on content creation. And it really doesn't seem to be paying off for them like it is for, say, Apple+. Plus. Also, Netflix is trying to raise prices while Apple Plus is about a third of the price of Netflix. And so I think Netflix is going to have a problem going forward. You see the chart there does not look particularly impressive. That said, Netflix has, an op has, the, has the potential to rally and just rip your face off if you're shorted. So I want to be short, but I want to define my risk. And the way to do that in Netflix is to buy a put spread. So specifically, uh, I would buy the June uh, 320, 370 put spread. You see there, when I put it together, you could buy that for about $16.5. Tiny bit more expensive right now, but that's a great way to get short exposure to Netflix, define your risk, and all we're looking for is Netflix to be below, and you see this there, be below $320 a share at that June expiration. Mm, all right, and and what do you think, Ben, as you take a look at this one? I mean, you know, as Scott noted, that chart's a tough one as you look at that drop-off. Yeah, there's been some selling here, to say the least, and uh, under pressure, no rejection of these lower levels. In many ways, kind of the mirror image of what we talked about in terms of deer to the upside, and I'd like to begin with the hourly time frame. I think there's a couple things to uh, take note of here. First and foremost, the well-defined trend of the downside. You can see that again, top left corner to bottom right corner. Uh, you can see again a couple well-defined areas of consolidation separated by this vertical development and most well-defined probably the selling we saw in reaction to quarterly results uh, again we're talking going back to uh, the end of january and since then how we've just kind of been in this uh, sideways consolidation recently into a new low but limited in terms of follow through so we've got a well-defined upper and lower extreme to keep an eye on right now 460 down to the 329 level but Again, you know, what concerns me is that we're kind of back to the midpoint of this range that we're in right now. Again, 460 down to the 329 level, and we're starting to roll over just a little bit. Further weakness here could potentially open up a door for retest these lower levels, and it's just continuation of the trend that we've seen. Now, again, we talk about, and much like deer to the upside, if we get a breakout below here right now, it's not as significant uh, just to see the levels taken out as it is to see a new area of value of form at a lower level, and I think that's what's kind of playing out here. As you take a net look at Netflix off the recent all-time highs around that 701 level you can see kind of value forming at lower levels and in this case one uh, right here below the 200 day moving average I'm sorry below the 50 day well below the 200 day moving average and then even look at RSI as we kind of stall out at that key area as I mentioned on the 60 RSI is kind of starting to roll over here as well and then you know I wanted to point out on the weekly we always talk about again these two phases of uh, uh, Price, discover, or price development, again, the horizontal or the vertical, Netflix broke out in a big way, just like Deer is trying to do. Remember, we talked about higher highs and higher lows and how we want to see an area of consolidation form at a higher level. In this case, it didn't really. We got more of a V-type top pattern. We spent very little time up at 700, got rejected essentially, and then like a hot butter through, hot knife through butter, you can see how we just ripped lower, again, right back into this 350 level. It, Tough to buy into this here right now. Uh, at the very least, maybe forming a little bottom here right now at this point. But yeah, it's been under pressure here to say the least as we've come off 700 back down to the 350 level, basically giving back half. All right, gentlemen, thank you. What a great big three today. Appreciate it. Scott Nations of Nations Indexes. Ben Lichtenstein, thank you. Always looking at the charts with the big three of Deer, Exxon, and Netflix. Thank you both.
Coming up next, New York Stock Exchange senior market strategist Michael Ranking will join me right here. We have plenty to discuss, of course, the moves in the market, rising yields, earnings, and much more. Trading 360 continues live from the New York Stock Exchange. Watchlist can help you keep track of securities you're interested in. To add a watchlist to the left sidebar, select the plus sign, then watchlist. When the default list appears, select the name box, then create watchlist. Enter a watchlist name. To begin adding securities, enter a ticker symbol in the symbol box, then select enter. Continue adding all the symbols you want in your watchlist, then select save. The existing list is replaced by the new one. You can also create watch lists from the Market Watch tab. After creating a watch list, you can add symbols to it from different locations across the platform. From the Charts tab, select the list icon and then add to watch list. From the Scan tab, right click a security and then add to watch list. And that's how you make a watch list. For more demos on how to think or swim, head to the Education Center on tdameritrade.com. Trading isn't just a hobby, it's your future. So you don't lose sight of the big picture, even when you're focused on what's happening right now. And Thinkorswim is right there with you to help you become a smarter investor. With an innovative trading platform full of customizable tools, dedicated trade desk pros, and a passionate trader community sharing strategies right on the platform. Because we take trading as seriously as you do. Thinkorswim by TD Ameritrade. Trading has changed forever as a new generation of investors make their impact on markets. It's more important than ever to navigate through the frenzy of meme stocks, IPOs, and the next wave of tech. And that's where we come in, discussing strategies and example trades on trending names. Take control of your financial future. Next Gen Investing, weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern, only on the TD Ameritrade Network. Welcome back. Live from the New York Stock Exchange, I'm Nicole Petalides. Take a look at the markets. You can see that the Dow is down 169 points at 34,691. The S&P just fractionally lower at this point at 45.39 after two weeks of gains. The Nasdaq showing some strength. They're up about a half a percent at 14,824. And the Russell small caps at 2063, pulling back about 15 points. So today for our 360 Spotlight, as I said, we are live from the New York Stock Exchange, and so it is our pleasure to bring in a special guest from the New York Stock Exchange, and that is Michael Reinking, Senior Market Strategist for the New York Stock Exchange. He's joining me live here, and we have so much to discuss. Of course, this is our very first day here, so glad to be here. Thank you yes. for having yes. us. Yes, yeah, welcome now. to, yeah, first and foremost, you know, welcome to the, to the floor. We're, you know, we're excited to have you here. And um, you know, I'm honored to be on the inaugural show with you, and hopefully this is our first conversation of many. Of many, without a doubt. So uh, we have lots to discuss. I mean, I think we should first just start with uh, your your wheelhouse, which is all about market strategy. At this point now, we're seeing the markets with a, a little bit of a rally, right? I mean, at least two weeks of gains. Yes. Now what? Yeah. Well, it's been you know, a, a very interesting environment, to say the least, right? So we've had a lot of volatility to start off 2022. Yeah, we're in the midst of the deepest and most prolonged pullback that we've seen in the market since the rally started two years ago. And that's as investors are you know, kind of dealing with the geopolitical concerns, um, you know, other macro headwinds, inflation, you know, and obviously the, the shift in you know, global central bank policy. And so we're a couple weeks away from Q1 earnings season. So I think that's gonna be kind of a welcome change for the investor base as they're able to kind of focus away from the macro a little bit and back into the micro and focusing on kind of company fundamentals and, and the earnings power within, yeah. within those companies. You know, as we had that rally, right, from 2008 to now, it was the rally that made everybody nervous the whole time, right? It just kept climbing and climbing. They hated the rally. They were waiting for corrections. Um, you had the pullback during the pandemic, which ended up being a great buying opportunity. But does it feel somewhat nerve wracking now too? Because there are so many elements. We just had a great conversation with one of our Charles Schwab guests who said that the rally just doesn't necessarily feel like it has legs. Right. Well, there is 
a ton of skepticism in this right. rally, right? And at this point, you know, the sentiment had gotten really, really negative. We've seen a little bit of a snapback over the last two weeks, right? right as, as some of that sentiment is reset. Um, I think you know, the, the issue that the market has is that we have the Federal Reserve, which is not supportive anymore, right? I mean, they've been very clear that we're going, they're going to fight inflation, get price stability back in right. the marketplace. So not only are we going to see you know, interest rates moving higher, we're also going to see QT eventually start to kick off here in the near term. Right. right? And so that's a little bit of a headwind if you kind of think about you know, the mantra that's worked for that past 10 years is don't fight the Fed, right? And you know, we, that, yeah. that's kind of fighting the Fed right now. Absolutely, um, absolutely. So I think we could be in just for a period of volatility, but you know, I think, I think you know, some sideways trading action in the market is not a bad thing considering right. the rally that we've seen over the last couple of years. And I mean, you're certainly seeing plenty of names. And with the volatility, it gives opportunity to people who want to trade, right? You can buy low or sell high or try and get in, at least for people who want to um, try to day trade it. For longer investors, I mean, they're faced with higher yields at this point, right? You have the 10 year at 2.5%. And we heard from Citi now talking today, talking about the Fed rate hikes, but that the next four hikes will all be 50 basis points each. I mean, does that seem too much? Yeah, I think that the, the, the hawkish sentiment's gotten a little bit right? ahead of itself, right? It feels sort of like when when stocks are rallying where, you know, analysts, the analyst community is always trying to catch up and raising price targets. It yeah. feels like you're seeing a little bit of that, you know, in terms of central bank policy. I'm not sure that we actually are able, you know, that the Federal Reserve is actually going to be able to get to, you know, where what they're talking about before something potentially breaks or you start to see the economy slow down. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think, you know, that that hawk sentiment has probably gotten a little bit ahead of itself. What are people saying overall? I mean, do they ask you a lot of questions? Because as we approach um, earnings season now, which you noted, um, you know, they're really telling me often that it's really going to be contingent upon the fundamentals and what we hear from earnings and guidance and such. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a great point. And, you know, I think the investors need to prepare for kind of a, a more normalized environment, right? So a growing but slowing earnings profile, mm -hmm. right? Last year, the you know we saw the S and P 500 earnings growth rate was over 50 percent. Clearly, that's not sustainable, right? right? We're looking at, at projections now for about nine percent on a year-over-year -year basis, um, you know. And, and what we've started to see is you know companies. We've seen the negative pre-announcements kind of you know, outnumbering positive pre-announcements two to one. Uh, we've right. seen estimates cut a little bit, but those are back to historical norms, right? So what we saw last year with positive earnings revisions, you know, driving, you know, driving the market higher, that's yeah. not going to be there uh, at this point. But I think that you know, there's still the opportunity for, you know, the, the, we've seen a resilience in corporate earnings that, you know, has, has far exceeded estimates throughout the last you know last year and we've seen the economy perform much better right right than people had thought so i think that that that's still that's still you know in place i feel like we should get out of the box a little bit you know whether it's you know crypto or anything else that you know ipos and all the listings and spacs and things like that are there things that are also just getting your attention one way or another that people are also looking at. Right, I mean, I th well, I think right now, I mean, the, the key that everybody's watching is, is interest rates, like mm -hmm. really, I mean, that's really what everybody's yeah. paying attention to. And the big conversation has been about, you know, kind of the inversion of yield curves and, yeah. and where you, you know, there's a lot of varying, you know, views in terms of which parts of the yield curve actually matter. Right. Um, you know, what I would say is that in terms of that, that, you know, we've, we've seen, Recessions, you know, typically happen, you know, a year or two years down the road, right? right? So even if you see these inversions in the near term, it doesn't mean that there's something right, you know, right in front of us. And I think that last week, Chair Powell really signaled that, you know, what the Federal Reserve is watching in terms of the yield curve, the very short, you know, the very short end, the three three year right. versus ten year, the three month bill versus the, you know, um, you know two quarters out, right, uh, or you know, six quarters out, you know, the three month bill futures, right? That's steepening so they don't see a recession in the near term right so if their viewpoint is that they don't see a recession right they're going to continue to be to move you know strong mm -hmm. i'm going to tell you i'm going to ask you your favorite fun fact about the nyc i'll tell you mine which will give you a second to think about yours <laughs> but mine always is that the ceiling is actually real gold leaf and has tobacco leaves on it um you know from the time that they used to trade tobacco here 
Um, you know, this is an iconic, iconic building. This is, you know, I guess arguably the financial capital of the world, and we're both so lucky to be working here each day. So what, what's your favorite fun fact? When yeah. somebody comes in to visit you and they say, Michael, thanks so much for having me here. I mean, what's one of your favorite fun facts that yeah, you tell I mean, them? I, I, I just, there's so much history in this building and, mm -hmm. you know, and it's always changing. And, you know, if you go upstairs and you can look in the boardroom, you know, we have the urn, you know, from, you know, from, the, from the Bolshevik era. You know, we have the, you know, a clock, the original clocks that show, you know, kind of where one stock was traded at a time and there was, you know, kind of, you know, on a five minute basis. So there's just so much here to see. And it's, it's just an amazing place to be every day. Yeah. Our, um, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for being with us today. Absolutely. I'm glad that you were able to join us and talk market strategy, but also really give our footprint here at the New York Stock Exchange. Great. So thank you for the warm welcome. Michael Reinking of the NYC Senior Market Strategist. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks. Coming up next, it's the Disruptors, and we have Tom White standing by to take a look at Roku. He'll have all the details and a way to trade it next. Whether you're an experienced investor or just getting started, TD Ameritrade offers a webcast that's right for you. Are you an active trader? Our active trading webcast series is designed to help you develop a deeper understanding of technical analysis, options, futures, and more. Best of all, you can ask questions by chatting directly with an education coach. It's interactive learning at its finest. Tune in live or watch on demand. Head over to tdameritrade.com slash webcasts and start learning today. We empower those who act. Those who see the correlation between upswings and downswings. Those who manage risk by meeting each obstacle with a perfectly executed strategy, a measured approach, the right tools, driving accuracy. CME Group, where risk meets opportunity. When traders tell us how to make Thinkorswim even better, we listen. Like Jack. He wanted a streamlined version he could access anywhere, no download necessary. And Kim. She wanted to execute a preset trade strategy in seconds. So we gave him Thinkorswim Web. Because platforms this innovative aren't just made for traders, they're made by them. Thinkorswim by TD Ameritrade. Welcome back to Trading 360 live from the New York Stock Exchange. It's time for the disruptors. Every single day we take a look at the disruptors and today's company is Roku. Tom White is here to take a look why this one is on his radar and a way to trade it as well. But first let's start. Why is this one on the move and why is it on your radar today? Hey, Nicole. Um, yeah, you know, this is one of those stocks that, uh, you know, has taken the brunt of the pullback that we've seen. It's down about 75% over the last seven or eight months here from their all-time highs above 490 bucks a share so it's had a significant pullback now what is roku well they disrupted everything we have uh subscriptions to multitudes of streaming services right and uh the one company that kind of uh congregates them all into one platform is uh roku and uh, the ability to have connected tvs uh, where you can aggregate all your different streaming services on one platform. The growth has been astronomical over the last four years. Roku had about 19 million active accounts in 2017. Uh, now they've tripled that to about six, just over 60 million by the end of uh, 2021. And streaming hours rose from about 4.3 billion hours to about 19.5 billion hours. So uh, over the, you know, if you look at the revenue, how Roku generates a revenue. About 81% is from advertising uh, on their platform. 
um, and it doesn't come from device sales like they initially did at the beginning because most TVs are connected now. So uh, they're gaining, uh, ga gaining market share. It's about 6.4% at this point as they kind of try to expand their footprint, uh, not only domestically, which is starting to get saturated a little bit, but international growth is going to be uh, one of their drivers moving forward. So uh, if you look at the transition that they've made into uh, those connected TV devices and the digital ad revenue spend by a lot of these streaming companies, um, you know, you wonder why Roku's pulled back so significantly from those all-time highs, but valuation's high, and the, and the company's given softer guidance and maybe the street anticipated moving forward. Deutsche Bank came out with a note uh, this morning on Roku saying uh, that latter stages of 2022, you should get some more clarity on guidance moving forward, how they're doing in the international markets, which is their next growth driver. We've seen that uh, same theme play out in Netflix, Nicole, where you get saturated in the U.S. and North America, but their growth drivers are going to be overseas. Uh, and uh, when you look at the amount of um, money they get, average revenue per user, it's about $41. It's a pretty significant increase from the previous year. So while they have, might have saturated here in the U.S. a little bit, their uh, average revenue per user continues to grow and being the leader and first uh, in the market as far as aggregation of all these different streaming services that we have, uh, the outlook's still pretty good yeah. even though the stocks pulled back pretty significantly. Yeah, it has. I mean, as you noted, right down year to date, about 40 percent. But the group overall has seen a lot of demand and some growth. And we just finished talking about Netflix um, in our our trading earlier in the big three. We see we saw how well streaming did at the Oscars yesterday. And so Roku is tied into all of these at this point now. How would you trade it as you did speak of the valuation? How would you trade Roku? Yeah, and I think that's the biggest concern for a lot of investors. It's been a falling knife over the last six or eight months. So uh, how do you play this to get in it if maybe your assumption is uh, along the lines of the Deutsche Bank analyst on his call today? So uh, I wanted to look at uh, because the stock has fallen, we've got implied volatility that's elevated in the overall market, not just Roku. Uh, I looked at a shorter term trade. They do have earnings uh, coming up at the end of April, so I kind of want to avoid that. Uh, so I looked at going out to the April monthly cycle, so 17 days to expiration, where I'm just going to sell a cash secured put. Uh, and in this example, uh, I'll look at the 120 strike put, which is currently just out of the money to the downside. Uh, if I can collect a $5.50 credit on that put, that's going to be the most I can make on it. But this, this type of trade is twofold, Nicole. If the stock does fall below 120 at expiration, I get to buy the shares at 114.50, which is a, a significant discount from where the stock is now, about 7% below the current share price uh, for uh, this stock. Now, the other way to look at this is you don't want it to fall below 120, so you can just keep that $550 credit for each put that you sell. So it's taking advantage of the higher implied volatility. It's a neutral to bullish type stance. You do have to have that capital to buy those shares if the stock does fall below $120 a share. But this might be the way to play it. It's a little bit more conservative to take that bullish stance and you're taking advantage of that higher implied volatility in the option market. Yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate it, understood. Thank you so much. Tom White with a good look there at Roku and an example trade. Thank you, Tom White. Coming up next, it's time to discuss those travel stocks. Are you planning a trip? It's our topic of the 360 round. Which companies are poised to outperform? Geopolitical tensions, could they impact international travel? Our panel will weigh in. It's a 13 hour flight. That's not a weekend trip. 15 minutes. Really? Why not? You're take off. Now, you downloaded the TD Ameritrade mobile app so you can quickly check the markets? Yeah, actually, I'm taking one last look at my dashboard before we board. Excellent. And you have Thinkorswim mobile? So I can finish analyzing the risk on this position. You two are all set. Have a great flight. Hey, thanks. We'll see ya. Right. Ah, they're getting so smart. Choose the app that fits your investing style. 
when traders tell us how to make Thinkorswim even better, we listen. Because platforms this innovative aren't just made for traders, they're made by them. Thinkorswim Trading from TD Ameritrade. Ben Lichtenstein here with your TD Ameritrade Network Futures Market Update. A bit of a risk-off sentiment to begin what looks like it could be a busy week to come. First, the four majors, the ES, the NASDAQ, the Dow, and the Russell are selling off some from the open a reflection of investors' unease as rates have spiked along with unease and the war in Ukraine. The Russell's leading the day way lower, down around 1%. The NASDAQ's teetering around unchanged, while the Dow and the ES are down around a half a percent this week. Keep an eye on a handful of Fed speakers, jobs reports, and personal income and spending to get a better idea of how the economy is performing with ongoing supply chain constraints and the 530 yield curve inverting, weighing on sentiment. Crude oil is also lower this morning. The WTI briefly back below 105 with rates here in the U.S. and COVID case counts in Japan on the rise, weighing on demand expectations. Official announced a four-day lockdown in Shanghai, China's largest city. Population is estimated to be around 25 million. We'll hear from OPEC later this week in the Thursday, or later this week on Thursday. And while well, we have G7 leaders calling for uh, the group to increase production in response to the ongoing war in Ukraine, OPEC again meets later this week. The UAE energy minister said it's essential for OPEC to stay together, stay focused, and not allow politics in. WTI futures holding around 106. Brent is at 113. Heating oil in Arbob gasoline futures all down around 6% on the day. This has been your TD Ameritrade Network futures market update. Now back to Trading 360 with Nicole Petalides. Thank you, Ben Lichtenstein, for that report. Welcome back to Trading 360. I'm Nicole Petalides live at the New York Stock Exchange. We're happy to be here, and it's time for our 360 round, and we're ready for a focus here on travel stocks. And for that, we're welcoming in our panel, Jed Kelly, Senior Analyst at Oppenheimer, and Adam Johnson, Portfolio Manager, Advisor Investments. Thank you both for being with us. So, Jed, I'll start with you. I, I know you sent along your uh, reports here on both Expedia and Booking Holdings. How are you feeling about these names? Um, yeah, so we, we recently upgraded Booking um, feeling pretty good, all things considered, with, with the Ukraine crisis. Uh, what was interesting was last week, there was a large European travel conference. Both Booking and Expedia were at this conference. They, um, they, they said they have a strong outlook for European travel this summer. So we're pre pre feeling pretty good. We think you're going to have a, a, a nice narrative in terms of demand trends when, when they report uh, later this month or in, 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 in early May. So as, as we kind of get into this recovery theme, uh, leisure travel still still remains strong. Yeah, yeah, and you know, within the notes that you have here, Adam, I'll steal from the OPCO notes to just formulate this question, and that is that urban and international travel could provide strong recovery tailwinds. So what are your thoughts, Adam? Do you, do you agree with that, just a broad-based statement? Oh, well, it's it's not a function of my agreeing, uh, Nicole. And by the way, good to be with you, and thanks for having me. Uh, but actually, that's the data. The data says we're already there. Load factors at a number of the U.S. airlines are already back to where they were pre-COVID uh, for leisure travel. We're not seeing the business travel yet. And admittedly, um, the airlines is... is <laughs> That's where they make their money uh, on the business travel. But the point is, you're now getting back to profitability at a number of the airlines. If you remember, Delta um, said, oh, this was about four months ago. Uh, Delta said, we will be profitable uh, by the uh, first or second quarter of this year. And they've actually done it sooner than that. So there is there is a tremendous um, uh, enthusiasm among, uh, among leisure travelers to get back out there. Yeah. When you see load factors as high as they are, and granted, I know some of the... Um, the uh, the equipment was taken offline, but when you see load factors as high as they are, um, that's very powerful, Nicole. Yeah, without a doubt. Jed, what what about the other names in the group? For example, I saw that you have the outperform on Booking and a market perform on Expedia. What other names are you watching? Why is one more of an outperform versus the others? Yeah, we 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 look at our our coverage is all relative. 
So, you know, we kind of look at the big three, right? Like Expedia, Booking, and Airbnb. I would say this, Expedia since COVID, it's up eight, its enterprise value is up 80% higher. Airbnb, it's trading at 10 times or 23 revenue. It's private valuation. Now it's public company is up three times. So they've kind of gotten these leisure uh, travel tailwinds that, you know, the pandemic, the, these work from anywhere trends is provided. But you look at booking, its enterprise value is still similar to where it was pre-COVID. And we think that has a lot to do to higher Europe exposure. So we actually think Europe's going to have a, a strong travel recovery. There's a lot more pent up demand. They're sort of like six, seven months behind where the U.S. was in terms of the reopening. So that's why we have a, an outperform on, on, um, on booking. But however, as you, you look okay. out, I think it's gonna be strong trends. Um, the one thing we're watching is just on a potential uh, recession in Europe, say at the later at the later part of this year. We actually think as a stock, uh, Airbnb would actually be, be the most exposed just based on where their multiple would be relative to the other names. You would see more. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And Adam, you mentioned some of the airlines and how there's been a lot of pent up demand and you've already seen some of these numbers matching pre-COVID. So what's the big picture as I know you have uh, a lot of different groups that you look at pertaining to travel, right? We, we have the travel names, but there's airlines, there's cruise lines, there's hotels, casinos. Sure. Um, is there anything that sort of stands out to you, Adam? Well, yeah, and, 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 and I think Jed made a point about valuation. Um, some of these stocks are incredibly cheap. Um, I mean, you look at you look at Delta, and um, Delta is going to make okay a buck fifty this year, but uh, they could very well make five fifty next year, which means they're trading at seven times a PE of seven times twenty twenty three earnings. You know, you look at Win, which is trading down at eighty bucks. That was a hundred and fifty dollars stock um, before COVID. Uh, Wynn Resorts, which gets about uh, a third of its money from Las Vegas, two thirds from Macau. Uh, Chinese authorities are um, liberalizing, making it easier for people actually to go to the casinos in Macau. So, um, you know, I think you look at valuation and, and there is a lot of upside um, to these names. They were taken down so far. Yeah, that you've made some great points there, Adam. And Jed, your final thoughts here as, you know, is there anything that could sort of derail this? You're more focused on the tailwinds than the headwinds, Jed? Yeah, I, I think there you would just say one would be Europe and then if inflation starts to eat into consumer spending, right? Like that's really the only thing that could get on travel. We're actually seeing business travel start to improve a little bit. Um, you know, we're hearing some commentary out of the airlines, but it's it's geopolitical in Europe and it's, you know, inflation causing uh, you know, inflation was any yeah. any part of stagflation would, would, would impact travel. Yeah. Great to see you both. Thank you very, very much. I wish you all beautiful trips this summer somewhere. Jed Kelly of Oppenheimer, Adam Johnson, Advisor Investments. Thank you both for being here with us. Appreciate it. And that's going to do it for us live at the New York Stock Exchange Trading 360 every single weekday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. I am Nicole Petalides. I will see you at 2 p.m. Eastern Time for the watch list. Do join me then. Fast Market is next. It's a 13 hour flight. That's not a weekend trip. 15 minutes. Really? Wow. You gotta take off. Now, you downloaded the TD Ameritrade mobile app so you can quickly check the markets? Yeah, actually, I'm taking one last look at my dashboard before we board. Excellent. And you have Thinkorswim mobile? So I can finish analyzing the risk on this position. You two are all set. Have a great flight. Thanks. We'll see ya. Ah, they're getting so smart. Choose the app that fits your investing style. Whether you're an experienced investor or just getting started, TD Ameritrade offers a webcast that's right for you. The Platform Demo Webcast Series is designed to help you broaden your knowledge of tools and resources available from TD Ameritrade. You'll learn tips and tricks to help navigate tdameritrade.com, think or swim, and mobile-based platforms. Best of all, you can ask questions by chatting directly with an education coach. It's interactive learning at its finest. Tune in live or watch on demand. Head over to tdameritrade.com slash webcasts and start learning today.
This is my headquarters. This is where I trade and manage my portfolio. Since I added futures, I have access to the oil markets and gold markets. Okay. I'm plugged into equities. Trade confirmed. And I have global access 24-7, meaning I can do what I need to do. Then I can focus on what I want to do. Visit your online broker today to learn more.
possibility of success uh, in your investing uh, by adding it, and of course, a lower break even point, Tom. Uh, in this particular case, you go out a couple weeks, the 115 put just out of the money, uh, and therefore uh, you sell it for four bucks, break even 111. But I think the, uh, the part that's oftentimes forgotten with this is you don't actually need the stock to go higher, although it's a bullish trade to be profitable. In fact, this stock can kind of languish around this 115 uh, area for the next two weeks. We can actually be max profit for this particular trade. It's far different than stock investing where you buy the shares and you're basically at risk penny for penny depending on the amount of shares that you bought. Yeah, and that 111 level uh, going into April expiration, probability of that being out of the money about 67.5%. Uh, you do have to have the capital if it does fall below that strike if you want to uh, let that go uh, you know, through uh, assignment where you have to buy the shares, so you have to keep that in mind. But this stock doesn't pay a dividend. So this is the, the trade-off if you sell a cash-secured put that's out of the money to the downside of, as opposed to buying for every 100 shares of stock you buy, you sell a call against it. Mm -hmm. So it looks like the same thing on a risk profile as far as just the shape of the uh, profit and loss, but there are different mechanisms within each one of those strategies. Uh, on that max you can make on that is four hundred dollars per option that you sell if it remains above 115 into expiration all right great stuff uh, alex coffee uh it, thanks for joining me today he's going to be hosting next gen investing coming up but let's take a quick look at the equity markets before we uh sign off here uh the s p 500 down about a quarter of one percent dow jones industrial average down just over a half a percent nasdaq 100 peaking back into the green up 0.2 percent and the Russell 2000 still down just over a percent we've got crude oil down nearly six percent um, we've got Bitcoin up over six percent uh, so we've got some asset classes moving but stick around right here on the TD Ameritrade Network as next gen investing is coming up next with Alex Coffey is going to be hosting that one the Iron Man and Jenny Horn have a great day It's a 13 hour flight. That's not a weekend trip. 15 minutes away. Oh, wow. I'm take off. Now, you downloaded the TD Ameritrade mobile app so you can quickly check the markets? Yeah, actually, I'm taking one last look at my dashboard before we board. Excellent. And you have Thinkorswim mobile? So I can finish analyzing the risk on this position. You two are all set. Have a great flight. Thanks. We'll see ya. Ah, they're getting so smart. Choose the app that fits your investing style. Feel that? That's the beat of global markets, the rhythm of the world. For most, the cadence of today. To us, the pace of tomorrow. It's people and machines uncovering opportunity. Cloud computing providing endless capacity. Blockchain making transactions safer and faster. New markets born where they weren't before. With ingenuity, technologies, and markets expertise, we create the possible. And when you do that, you don't chase the pace of tomorrow. You set it. NASDAQ. Rewrite tomorrow. Many traders may be willing to take on additional risk in pursuit of aggressive growth in their portfolio. More power to them. But if you're looking for a less risky alternative, you might want to consider checking out our income investing course. In the income investing course, you'll explore investing strategies designed to generate regular income and preserve capital. First, we'll delve into risk and return preferences. You will learn about the different ways to allocate a portfolio and create a payment schedule. Then we'll take a deep dive into the assets commonly held in income portfolios, dividend stocks, bonds, equity REITs, and cash. You'll also learn about routines for managing a portfolio over time. 
Along the way, you'll watch videos, take quizzes, and perform paper trades to practice your new skills. So if you're looking for an edge, consider your education. Head to the Education tab on Thinkorswim for the Income Investing course and a whole lot more. Feel that? That's the beat of global markets, the rhythm of the world. For most, the cadence of today. To us, the pace of tomorrow. It's people and machines uncovering opportunity. Cloud computing providing endless capacity. Blockchain making transactions safer and faster. New markets born where they weren't before. With ingenuity, technologies, and markets expertise, we create the possible. And when you do that, you don't chase the pace of tomorrow. You set it. NASDAQ. Rewrite tomorrow. So what are you working on? I'm searching for info on options trading, and look, it feels like I'm just wasting time. Wasted time is wasted opportunity. Exactly. That's why TD Ameritrade designed a first-of-its-kind personalized education center. Oh. See, you just, oh. Oh, this is easy. Yeah, and that's... Oh, just what I need. Courses mm -hmm. on options trading, webcasts, tutorials. Yeah, their award-winning content is tailored to fit your investing goals and interests, and it learns with you. So as you become smarter, so do its recommendations. So it's like my streaming service. Oh, well, exactly. Well, except now you're binge learning. Ooh, I like that. Thank you. <laughs> I just came up with that. You're funny. Learn fast with the TD Ameritrade Education Center. Call 866-300-9417 or visit tdameritrade.com slash learn. Get started today and for a limited time, get up to $800 when you open and fund an account. That's 866-300-9417 or tdameritrade.com slash learn.
community expecting for Lululemon. I have to say, anecdotal shoes, which will not be included in this earnings season, obviously, but I'm very excited. <laughs> I was actually wondering if you, if they would have hooked you in with those bliss feel sneakers. I know you're a runner, <laughs> um, but in terms of Lululemon, they already kind of gave a, a downbeat outlook back in early January, saying that earnings and revenue would be at the low end of a range. So in terms of expectations, earnings per share are expected to come in at three dollars and twenty seven cents on revenue of two point one three billion dollars. I mean, Lululemon is a stock that has seen tremendous growth, especially during the pandemic, really benefited from that stay at home and yoga pants trend, although we are starting to see revenue growth slow, so still growth, but it's slowing. Uh, Lululemon was hit by Omicron, supply chain problems, staff shortages last quarter, like so many other retailers, which is why they came out with kind of that downbeat forecast. So we'll see how those ultimately ended up hurting the company and then when it gives its outlook, if it gives an outlook, uh, considering aside from Omicron for the most part that those headwinds still exist, how will that will impact business going forward. Also get a sense of how business in China is doing because that area obviously still does have that uptick in COVID cases, renewed lockdowns. We know it's a growth area for Lululemon. Um, and also, you know, we've talked about that potential shift from international brands to more domestic brands in China it didn't seem to have an impact on uh, Nike, its competitor. They saw notable growth in China, but let's see what Lululemon says. Uh, and also, as you, you mentioned, it won't be included in these Q4 numbers, the holiday quarter, but uh, the Bliss Feel running shoe priced at $148 just hit stores last week. So maybe they'll give some early updates in terms of how that's performing. They're attempting to lure customers in with a 30 day trial period. You can return those sneakers um, back in any condition, they're saying. So Jenny, I don't know if that actually did lure you in, but Jefferies did warn that it could be an attractive revenue generator, but it won't be good for margins and it could be a distraction from its core business. So analysts kind of mixed on, uh, on the impact of its new sneakers. I'm an, I'm an on sneaker girl, so I don't know that I'm, I'll stick with the aligned leggings, but not switching over to the sneakers. Caroline, I, I'm wondering here as a bystander, and I've long said I think this company uh, is missing a major market within uh, kind of the male apparel, the uh, men's apparel, that they need to be sponsoring some type of a big golfer or something and getting this out there and reaching a whole new crowd because I know so many people uh, that, are, that are wearing their, their stuff uh, for those type of activities. But I'm not going there with the, with the question. My question to you, Caroline, is we hear all this stuff about inflation and costs rising. And naturally, if our wages, uh, you know, on the balance aren't going to keep, uh, you know, pace with that, we're going to probably cut back on discretionary spending if we're not willing to go into, uh, you know, some type of debt. Do we start looking to the knockoff brands or maybe the brands that don't have the luster of, of a name like uh, Lululemon, which is historically perceived as higher quality, but also higher price point? Do some of its lower priced peers that have largely just copied the concept but don't carry that brand recognition uh, start to steal the spotlight. Lululemon certainly has that strong brand recognition. I know there are some pretty good dupes on Amazon for a third of the price, but I mean, that's the question I think heading into this report. Basically, you know, with gas prices high, food prices high, will consumers, you know, sentiment is waning, but we haven't seen it hit demand yet. Mm -hmm. But at what point do we start to, and will companies like Lululemon be the ones to suffer. I mean, anecdotally, I'm hearing of stories of lines outside of the Rolex store and outside of the Hermes store. So, I mean, or Hermes, I should say, but it's, um, you know, so clearly for the luxury segment, there's still very much demand. I will say that I did see some price target cuts heading into this report, which is tomorrow uh, after the bell. Um, MKM cut last week to $438 from $481, but maintains a buy rating. Meanwhile, Deutsche Bank slashed to $410 from $453, also a buy rating. Lululemon currently trades around $326, so still a lot of upside. And the majority of analysts still do have a buy rating at this point, 22 buys, 10 holds, and only one sell. Although keep in mind, Lululemon is down some 16% year to date, even more if you go out over the past um, six months. Now, earlier this month, Bernstein initiated coverage on Lulu with an underperform rating and a $260 price target. She warned about slower growth, but also called Lululemon's products pricey. 
So that has something to do with that bearish call from Bernstein, or um, also cautious about uh, Lululemon entering the sneaker market. So there's kind of both sides there, but I, it did stand out that she specifically called those products pricey, which we know they're not necessarily affordable or low budget. Um, but you know, there, there is something to be said about that Lululemon brand, that, that logo that people seem to love, and many would say quality products. So I guess it's just kind of, we'll have to wait and see, especially with what Lulu says about, uh, on, about their outlook on the earnings call. Yeah, Caroline, you make a really good point as prices continue to surge and gas being obviously the biggest concern, can you afford to go to Lululemon anymore? And I will agree that the Align leggings, I don't think there's anything else like them, but can I afford to splurge at Lululemon if everything else is more expensive? I'm not really sure. And I don't really know if And how they people last a long time, so you don't necessarily have to replace them as often as maybe Lululemon would like. Yes, and they have a great return policy. If you ever have anything wrong, they take them back. I can't give a full report yet on the shoes because I haven't gotten them yet. They arrive actually tomorrow, but I will give, I will run and I will give a full report back because I am very excited to try and hopefully not be disappointed. But Caroline, thank you so much for your insight as always. That is Caroline Woods, TD Ameritrade Network contributor. Now coming up next, we will talk all things pot stocks, specifically Canopy Growth, seeing some weakness today after what was a pretty stellar session on Friday. We'll dive more into the legalization or potential legalization in this space coming up next. Watchlist can help you keep track of securities you're interested in. To add a watchlist to the left sidebar, select the plus sign, then watchlist. When the default list appears, select the name box, then create watchlist. Enter a watchlist name. To begin adding securities, enter a ticker symbol in the symbol box, then select enter. Continue adding all the symbols you want in your watchlist, then select save. The existing list is replaced by the new one. You can also create watch lists from the Market Watch tab. After creating a watch list, you can add symbols to it from different locations across the platform. From the Charts tab, select the list icon and then add to watch list. From the Scan tab, right click a security and then add to watch list. And that's how you make a watch list. For more demos on how to think or swim, head to the Education Center on tdameritrade.com. Trading isn't just a hobby, it's your future. So you don't lose sight of the big picture, even when you're focused on what's happening right now. And Thinkorswim is right there with you to help you become a smarter investor. With an innovative trading platform full of customizable tools, dedicated trade desk pros, and a passionate trader community sharing strategies right on the platform. Because we take trading as seriously as you do. Thinkorswim by TD Ameritrade. We empower those who act. Those who see the correlation between upswings and downswings. Those who manage risk by meeting each obstacle with a perfectly executed strategy, a measured approach, the right tools, driving accuracy. CME Group, where risk meets opportunity. Thank you, Maria. Welcome back to Next Turn Investing on this Monday now afternoon. Just over two hours to the closing bell, and it's now time for under 30. Max Coffee alongside Jenny Horn. Jenny, we're talking some cannabis. We're specifically focusing on canopy growth and these names alongside so many of the forgotten assets. The meme stocks came back to life. Cannabis came back to life. Crypto came back to life. Tesla came back to life. What do these all have in common? Are they all just short volatility trades? I don't know. There's certainly more to this story though with 
the rumblings of possible federal legalization again uh, coming on the docket. Yeah, with the surge of these meme stocks over the last week, I'd say we're back in like 2020, 2021, <laughs> but these pot stocks, I feel like we're back in like 2016. So I do think the resurgence of these names has been quite interesting, and like Alex mentioned, on the hopes of federal legalization. But to tell us more on these names and canopy growth is Jeff Pierce, TD Ameritrade Network contributor. So Jeff, my biggest question is, because I've read a lot about this bill and that there's the concern obviously goes to the Senate and it doesn't pass, and this is the second time this has happened, is we initially saw such strength in these names. You know, all of these names jumped. We saw Tilray up 40% for the week, but was it all on false hope? Because if this bill just gets shot down, do these names just continue extending their losses? Well, we know these stocks are not immune to volatility, right? We've certainly mm -hmm. seen that among their names. It may be a bit of a buy the rumor, sell the news situation for uh, people that are holding on to it. I, I, I would imagine if they're still concerned it's not going to go through through the Senate, they're at least hopeful that a push forward on the bill could take a closer look at some of the various aspects beyond just legalization, right? If you think about banks, for example, and their abilities to do business with cannabis companies. Uh, we look at a company specifically like CGC, uh, we know that they've been losing money. Third quarter, they had a net loss narrowed at about 108 million Canadian dollars. Uh, that's down from 904 million, but in line with expectations. Net revenue down 8% year over year. What these companies are doing uh, that we've noticed a lot over the last few years, as you said, we've been talking about them for five, six years now at least, um, is we're seeing a lot more M&A activity. We're watching uh, these companies buy each other up as kind of the hopes of legalization, especially in the U.S., continue to kind of come up each year, but we're also watching them try to spend less money. And that's been a major benefactor for some of these companies that have been in there uh, tightening up their expenses. If we look at, at Canopy last quarter, they declined, their expenses declined by 19% year over year, largely due to these reductions. Um, and certainly they are seeing some new revenue streams. You think about some of the drink options out there, the, the vaping options, that sort of thing. That's offsetting some of the decline that they're seeing in Canadian cannabis sales, which is helpful for some of these bigger names. Jeff, I think a lot of the possible, you know, combination of these names, of course, the devaluation that we've seen in, in some of the prices is all ultimately, if these companies are gonna succeed in their goals, probably long-term beneficial. When they're trading at 100 times uh, what they currently are now, y there's really no price, that, there's really nothing they can do to ever merit that valuation. They were put in a tough spot. And so now things are a little bit maybe more realistic for, for a long-term future. But my, my question to you is, are we kind of conveniently ex uh, explaining this rally that we've seen because there was news, when rather it just was a kind of convenient uh, coincidence? I look at some of those other asset classes that I talked about, meme stocks, volatility cratering, Tesla resurging, crypto resurging, and now I look at cannabis stocks resurging. Is this just animal spirits doing what they do best and finding risk where they can take it? Well, anytime we hear some news, especially around legalization, typically you're gonna see some movement in these stocks. And certainly there are some investors that are hopeful that this is you know, the big news that they've been waiting for for years to come. Other investors are looking at it and thinking, you know, this may not be the time that we see that legalization. But what we're watching investors do and hold on to is that long-term hope that they see uh, legalization and they see this market come to what they expect it to be. And that's another question, right, is how big is the addressable market here in the U.S.? There's a lot of estimations thrown out. We don't necessarily know. One of the things that sets Canopy aside uh, from some of the other in the group is their, their uh, connection to Constellation brands, right? They, they've had a stake in them since 2017. They've invested about $4 billion. They've got about 38% ownership. They do have outstanding warrants that could get them even more ownership, up to about 53% stake in the company. So far, since their 2017 investment, Constellation's lost about $424 million on Canopy, but they've continued to be invested in them. And obviously, like a lot of investors out there, it's because their hope is in this future where we do see legalization and we see this big addressable market and uh, and some of these names right now that we're seeing take over in these acquisitions, they're really trying to get a foothold in that market. They want to have the biggest possible share. We think about back when Canopy announced to acquire uh, Acreage Holdings, they paid $300 million up front. They also said it was about a $3.4 billion deal at the time, but the agreement depended on cannabis being legalized. So there are a lot of different moving parts 
a lot of expectations that are built in this market. Seeing news like this can move a market that's entirely built on expectation. Yeah, and Jeff, you have to applaud those investors because it's taken a good degree of patience to wait for any hopes of legalization. I mean, we're still only in the beginning phases, I feel like, as this bill is expected from what I've gathered from the analyst community to not pass in the Senate. But an interesting discussion in the pot stocks on the last. Jeff Pierce, thank you so much for joining us. And Alex, we are still seeing the NASDAQ holding on to those gains, but just barely now. <laughs> Yeah, the last thought I want to say here is those investments by like alcohol companies in many mm -hmm. cases, don't think of them necessarily as offensive investments, but rather defensive investments is what companies stand to lose the most. But that does it for us. Thanks as always for tuning in to Next Gen Investing. Mixed Market continues. We've got the watch list coming up next. It's a 13 hour flight. That's not a weekend trip. 15 minutes. Really? Wow. Wow. You're going to take off. Now, you downloaded the TD Ameritrade mobile app so you can quickly check the markets? Yeah, actually, I'm taking one last look at my dashboard before we board. Excellent. And you have Thinkorswim mobile? So I can finish analyzing the risk on this position. You two are all set. Have a great flight. Thanks. We'll see ya. Right. Nah, they're getting so smart. Choose the app that fits your investing style. that that's the beat of global markets the rhythm of the world for most the cadence of today to us the pace of tomorrow it's people and machines uncovering opportunity cloud computing providing endless capacity blockchain making transactions safer and faster new markets born where they weren't before with ingenuity, technologies, and markets expertise, we create the possible. And when you do that, you don't chase the pace of tomorrow. You set it. NASDAQ. Rewrite tomorrow. Many traders may be willing to take on additional risk in pursuit of aggressive growth in their portfolio. More power to them. But if you're looking for a less risky alternative, you might want to consider checking out our Income Investing course. In the Income Investing course, you'll explore investing strategies designed to generate regular income and preserve capital. First, we'll delve into risk and return preferences. You will learn about the different ways to allocate a portfolio and create a payment schedule. Then we'll take a deep dive into the assets commonly held in income portfolios, dividend stocks, bonds, equity REITs, and cash. You'll also learn about routines for managing a portfolio over time. Along the way, you'll watch videos, take quizzes, and perform paper trades to practice your new skills. So if you're looking for an edge, consider your education. Head to the Education tab on Thinkorswim for the Income Investing course and a whole lot more. Feel that? That's the beat of global markets, the rhythm of the world. For most, the cadence of today. To us, the pace of tomorrow. It's people and machines uncovering opportunity. Cloud computing providing endless capacity. Blockchain making transactions safer and faster. New markets born where they weren't before. With ingenuity, technologies, and markets expertise, we create the possible. And when you do that, you don't chase the pace of tomorrow. You set it. NASDAQ. Rewrite tomorrow. So what are you working on? I'm searching for info on options trading, and look, it feels like I'm just wasting time. Man, wasted time is wasted opportunity. Exactly. That's why TD Ameritrade designed a first-of-its-kind personalized education center. Oh. See, you just, oh. Oh, this is easy. Yeah, and that's... Oh, 
just what I need. Mm -hmm. Courses on options trading, webcasts, tutorials. Yeah, their award-winning content is tailored to fit your investing goals and interests, and it learns with you. So as you become smarter, so do its recommendations. So it's like my streaming service. Oh, exactly. Well, except now you're binge learning. Ooh, I like that. Thank you. <laughs> I just came up with that. You're funny. Learn fast with the TD Ameritrade Education Center. Call 866-300-9417 or visit tdameritrade.com slash learn. Get started today and for a limited time, get up to $800 when you open and fund an account. That's 866-300-9417 or tdameritrade.com slash learn. This is my headquarters. This is where I trade and manage my portfolio. Since I added futures, I have access to the oil markets and gold markets. Okay. I'm plugged into equities, trade confirmed. And I have global access 24 seven, meaning I can do what I need to do. Then I can focus on what I wanna do. Visit your online broker today to learn more.